What's up, everybody? Jeff in control. Robinson here with a Necron Codex review stream. I have done a Tau preview earlier. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, this is there. If you're unfamiliar with how this goes, I'm going to be announcing this on my Twitters. I'm going to be sharing the time. So far, I've been imprecise on that time, but I'm going to try to get better about that. Um, but if you, you can always just watch it on YouTube basically that night or the day after or whatever at your leisure. Um, and this is what you can expect for the foreseeable future until they shut down this program or nothing. You know, maybe we just go on forever. Um, but I'm supposed to be getting all the codexes and I want to review them. We're going to do it from the angle not of someone that's a Necron professional or a Tau god, uh, but rather from someone that plays this game fanatically, competes, travels, and considers himself a fairly strategic and decent mind. So um, I am not by any means a Necron player. But I know a lot of Necron players. I know Necrons pretty well, and I'm excited to just kind of dive into the Codex. So without further ado, uh, let me give you a little bit of a precursor about this. I've already read this book a couple of times. Um, I'm very impressed with it. The Tau Codex, when I read it, my initial response was a little bit of like, a, uh, uh, like it's, it's, I think Tau players have stuff in there to be excited about. Um, not that they would tell you that online, but there is some stuff in there that's good. The Necron Codex, to me, is very powerful. Um, now, when I say that, I don't, think of my, I don't think to myself, wow, these guys are about to really take the scene by storm. It's a top-tier, number-one Codex type of thing. But I do think it's a very competitive Codex. I do think, if, if not top-tier, it's, it's right up there. Uh, it's kind of hard, because you measure things against like the Terranid or Eldar Codex. And I think right now, just about everybody falls short. Um, certainly there's there's clusters of codexes that can compete and there's scenarios and there's lists but um, single codex it's still pretty much the Eldar and Terranid, sh Terranid show right now but the Necrons are not far off from that so what we learned last time I did the stream is it went on for like two and a half hours that's probably too long um, so I am going to do page by page uh, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go much quicker through the beginning where it's just the fluff. I'm gonna show you the pages, but I'm almost not even gonna talk about it. I think we're gonna spend the next hour or so on the stat lines of all the different guys, and then we're gonna close out the stream much how we did last time, talking about um, you know ideas. And if you guys have questions, I can flip to some stuff. But these codexes take a while to get through, man. I want to go through all the stratagems. I want to go through the warlord traits the dynasties, all that kind of stuff. That takes a long time. And last time I was like, let's talk about the fluff for an hour, which is fun. But my voice was wrecked at the end. Um, so that's what you can expect. So if you're on YouTube and you're watching this, make sure and subscribe to the channel so you can get notifications uh, about this going on in the future if this is interesting to you. Do talk about it in the chat. Um, I read a lot of the, I read all the comments and still do on the Tau one. It's been really fun to interact that way. And um, if you're here on, on Twitch, of course, what's up guys, I love you all. Thank you very much. My beautiful subs, um, you guys are the best. But I want to talk on a, uh, touch on a couple of things too. If you're noticing, we are doing this on a beautiful mouse pad. So I was just at Adepticon, which I'll talk about probably on my live stream, and I'm gonna I'll write a blog about it and stuff like that, but probably not talk about it too much here. Uh, but while I was at Adepticon, I was with Frankie um, from Frontline Gaming, and they've been working on this. And this is a I don't know what to call it, but it's a table-sized mouse pad, which is if you haven't used it, can I suggest even if you're like I don't like your I don't like that Jeff I'm not buying the one that's okay you don't have to buy mine but I love table sized mouse pads these are freaking fantastic well anyways we're gonna be having one come out it's gonna have the beautiful chat utopia logo um, and it's otherwise just a very simple sleek design just kind of cool little graphical thing there not something too terribly special but I think that'll be a cool way to show off that you know we're a part of something pretty cool here and it's a great way to support the channel too um, and then there's a couple other products along those lines we plan on, on uh, selling. And at the, well, no, I have, I'm, I'm working on something else really big with Games Workshop, but I can't talk about it till it's m more further along. So that's it. That's my sellout hour. So let's go ahead and get into this right now. Um, beautiful Necron Codex. Okay. So the kind of funny thing about this, let's just go ahead and talk about the elephant in the room, by the way. This, this Codex was spoiled. Um, somebody like a week ago has already shown pictures about everything in this. Um, I guess some of the information was weird, so it was kind of a, it was like an earlier edition codex that went out to somebody, and then they just turned around and spoiled it for everyone. So you are going to see some new stuff, but that spoil was fairly accurate. Um, I think it's a shame, and I hope it doesn't ruin it for the rest of us, because I take this really serious. I signed NDAs and stuff like that, and 
Um, the embargo day was yesterday, but I was in Chicago for Adepticon, so I obviously couldn't do it. So I rushed home today to do it, and uh, it kind of sucks when somebody ruins that for us. So hopefully in the future, that's more well-respected. Um, so this this is the new awesome setup, by the way. This is actually my wife Anna's desk. She works at Twitch. You might know her. Um, and she's let me use her space. I think it's just I, it's much more fantastic. We have an overhead camera, so I don't have to like hold it up to you. That being said, I know that you're not going to be able to read every single detail and see every single point from that angle. And there still is a little bit of gloss going on here. But I'm going to describe for you everything page by page as we get to it. So um, don't fret too much. But I think this is still a pretty good top-down vision of this. So the beginning of every codex, this is the fluff area. And I love it. And... If I had the voice, or if there's like 5,000 of you watching, maybe I would go through each and every freaking one of these. But what I like about these pages and what they do is they give you a little bit of fluff about each of the different kind of dynasties. And each of the dynasties are really important, by the way, not only because of the fluff, but because most of you don't necessarily want to paint all of your Necrons as just gunmetal gray or whatever that is. The, uh, you know, luminescent green and that's it. That would be kind of boring if everyone had the same colored Necrons. So a lot of these are just showing you nope you can do this different stuff and then you can uh, of course follow the main ones like my adeptus mechanicus they're all painted mars which you know for some people might be really boring but i actually like the paint scheme uh and some of the fluff in here is pretty cool they did that you know just to go back to that tau codex for a second by the way some of the fluff there was really amazing they revealed that they were talking to like they have squats working mi mining ships for them they ended up talking to um they, they, they met some Skaven in space and stuff like that. Like, that's so bold for Games Workshop to do that. Uh, squats in particular is kind of like breaking up with your first love and then still, like, inviting them to all the weddings and dinners and stuff and being like, yeah, they're still here. A little bit awkward out there, but they did it, and they're cool with it. And then here's the pages. I, I like that they did this, by the way. Every unit and character gets a full page, so you can just kind of know something about them. I think that makes it just that much more personable and good. Um, like I said, we're going to buzz right through this, though. Flayed ones, man. Ugh, can't wait to come back to that, I'll tell you. One of the things, while we're building up to this, that I really like about this codex, and maybe I'm just completely wrong, we'll see how this, this pans out, uh, but this codex, to me, feels like multiple builds when I look at this. You know how you open up some codexes and you're like, alright, there's like four things that you spam, and that's it. And then there's the guy who's like, No! My friends and I drank Goldschlager and ate pretzels, and we were finding, wouldn't you know it, uh, the Malice Scepter is one of the better units in that gosh darn Teradic. No, don't do that, no. But the Necron Codex, you're going to see some diversity, um, even along the lines of melee-focused armies, shooting, balanced. But for me, the part that really leapt out at me is the characters holy toledo and I, I went right to the pages of the of you know you start with the hqs and as i was going through it i was like i want that one i want that one i want that one as well and now i want that one too and you're going to want all of them and i think that's going to be your your uh, bottleneck that's going to be your pressure point uh you necron players out there as you read through this as you're like uh they're all fun they're all different and they're all powerful in their own way and then one of the first things, uh, I was talking about this codex with my friends at Adepticon, um, some of the best in the whole country, your, you know, Sean Nadens and uh, Nick Roses and, and some of these guys. Uh, one of the first things that leapt out at them from this codex was the uh, Satans and, and the, the Nightbringer, the Deceiver, and just the different, the Tesseract Volt, so kind of the more powerful things. We'll show you the, the Satan powers in a second. I call them Satans, by the way. I know that someone's going to correct that. I'm okay with it. Can we just say that? Can we just say that moving forward, by the way? Um, I was, like, murdering the word Kalyan. Kalyan, or... Uh, anyways, the Tao language. People were nice about it, though. I didn't get any hate. It's just that people were messing with me, like, hey, here's how you say it. I'm like, all right, thank you. But just moving forward, you can always correct me, but it, I don't care. Is the, you know... It's a, it's a fake language. <laughs> All right. So here's so I, that was me just flipping through that. And again, give me feedback. If you're like, no, Jeff, I want you to slow down on this and that. 
you want to see more of something or, or less of something, always feel free to let me know. This is a learning process. Ultimately, I want it to be entertaining and cool for you guys. Um, so every codex kind of goes the same way. We get to the Dynasty's Ascendant page, and it kind of talks about what you can generically see for your army, for your race. Uh, you got Living Metal. So if something has the Living Metal rule, it says at the beginning of your turn, this unit regains one Lost Wound. That's a big deal. There's a lot of multi-wound guys. Uh, most of the characters, if not all of them, I, I say most when I'm not absolutely certain that all of them have it, but I think all of them do uh, have Living Metal. Although, as I say that, I'm looking... Oh, he's got it. Never mind. Uh, Emotech does have it, but that's just incredible. That's a, that's amazing. All the like little odd smites that go through, um, all the just little dinks and donks wounds on these guys that have six wounds or five or four. Healing one per turn is actually incredibly powerful because that is something that for other armies, 99% uh, of armies, by the way, don't really have access to that. So beginning to hurt somebody or getting past their two-up save on a lucky die roll or two um, is the beginning of the end for that person, but for the Necrons, it's not even close. Uh, I think that's a really cool ability. I think we all pretty much understand why that's powerful. Then there's reanimation protocols, and I'm just going to read through this. I think it's the same in the index. You'll have to correct me if I'm wrong, but it's just a it's it's their ability. Roll a d6 for each slain model from this unit, unless the whole unit has been completely destroyed. At the beginning of your turn, do not roll for models that have fled the unit. So if you lose some, if you lose five guys and then you lose like three more to morale, you don't get reanimation protocols for those three. I will say most, if not all, Necrons are leadership 10. So yeah, you can take some big units. I'm thinking flayed ones or warriors, but for the most part, morale is not an issue. On a five plus, the model's reanimation protocols activate and it is returned to this unit with its full complement of wounds. Otherwise, it remains inactive. That's key language here. Although you can roll again at the start of each of your subsequent, subsequent turns, when a model's reanimation protocols activate, set it up in unit coherency with any model from this unit that has not returned to the unit as a result of reanimation protocols this turn and more than one inch away from the enemy models. So you can't put them back into combat, but you can put them back into a unit that is in combat. Uh, it's just that they can't be within one inch. So that model in particular, or whatever you reactivate, cannot, um, cannot you know, be in combat swinging. Uh, if there's nowhere to place them, do not set it up. You can make reanimation protocols rolls for this model again in subsequent turns. So that's a huge deal. Uh, I know, again, this was in the index, I believe, but the idea that it keeps going until everyone's reanimated or the entire unit's wiped out, it's pretty fun. There's some pretty in insane uh, implications with that, and uh, it involves like ghost arcs and blocks of 20 warriors and stuff like that. Um, I don't see a lot of excitement about it, but I think with this codex, it begins to become more exciting. There's a lot of reroll ones for reanimation protocol, a lot of uh, do it on a plus one, so a four plus. Um, and, you know, it's, it's well, anyways, we'll talk about those kind of strategies later. But let's get into the, some of these. So that's the generic rules. It then talks about dynasties. So, of course, we'll get to that page. That's towards the end, usually. Um, but the different dynasties have overall uh, abilities as well. So Emotech's the first one. He's the big bad cheese. He's 10 power. Um, two up save, three attacks, leadership 10, wound 6, tough 5, strength 5, ballistic skill, weapon skill 2, and movement 5. That movement 5 is pretty Necron wide. They're mostly a 5 inch moving army uh, to give you the, uh, the feel of the shambling, reawakening space terminators. Um, pretty cool. But what I like about these characters is they are just so chock full of flavorful stuff. Um, he has the Gauntlet of Fire, which is just an assault d6, strength 4. Uh, AP nothing, damage one, flame or weapon. Range eight, so no, he can't like deep strike somewhere and do it. So it's not really like something you're going to build this guy around, but it's just a nice little thing that he has. You charge him, okay, well, I'm, I'm flaming you a little bit here. Then he has Staff of the Destroyer in the shooting. It is a salt three, 18 inches, strength six, minus three, two damage. Eh. Just a nice little thing there as well. And then in melee, it's plus one strength, minus three, two damage as well. So Emotech's not a damage dealer per se, but he'll drop down a couple of guys um and it's just one of those it's just one of those things where you're assaulting into the necrons that's not necessarily where they're known to be super amazing and good but emutech can hold himself up especially considering he has a two-up save and then we'll get to all of his rules but down there at the at the bottom you'll see phase shifter he has a four plus in vol as well on a tough five model so again uh he's a custodes you know we're not we're not writing home saying this is the most invincible thing you've ever seen in your life but a two-up save is great four up in vol 
is a nice little check against the odd melter that gets in there and then keep in mind again that he can just heal up every turn so if he survives a fight or is able to disengage and fall back he's now you know going from a six wound guy to a seven to an eight uh because he lost wounds not literally building up on that so let's get into some of these rules so Farron of the and here's again where i'm going to be butchering all these words and someone out there sitting caressing their like egyptian staff is like oh, i can't believe he mispronounced that it's the Sawtech dynasty or Sawtech. I'm going to call it Sawtech. That's what we're going with. There's nobody here to tell me otherwise. Anna, what's this dynasty called? She doesn't know. Okay, so I, I know. Sawtech. S A U T E K H. How would you say that? <laughs> she gave exactly the reaction I would want her to go. She goes, <laughs> who cares? So it is what it is. Anyways, we're moving forward. Uh, Imatech, the Stormlord, can use My Will Be Done ability twice a turn, but only if you choose friendly Sawtech infantry. You need to be affected by it both times. So let's go right from there to My Will Be Done. A lot of these characters have this rule, but I've noticed that it's a little bit different. Is the chat trying to help me? Sawtech? You do it too. Or are you just being silly? I can't tell. Anyways, Alleluia would be the one that I would ask, but I don't see his answer over there. Um, at the beginning of your, your turn, choose a friendly Necrons infantry unit within six inches of Emotech, the Stormlord. Add one to advance, charge, and hit rolls for that unit until the beginning of your next turn. A unit can only be chosen as a target of this ability once in each turn. So you can't stack it or anything like that. And it, they're all called My Will Be Done for the most part. And it's pretty clear here that you don't like, you know, maybe there's like a forge roll and it's not called My Will Be Done. It's called like May My Will Be Done. They're like, can it stack then? Anyways, the intention is obviously you only get one. But one to hit is a big freaking deal. Um, Necrons are not bad in the weapon skill or bliss skill department. They're mostly bliss skill three. There's the odd twos. Um, but that's amazing. That means there's a lot of stuff now hitting on twos. It does specify infantry, so we're not lighting up the universe here with excitement but it's still just he's in the back that block of warriors that puts out a lot of shots and can do some damage now they're hitting on twos um it makes you faster it makes you uh more reliably charge as well so it's a pretty cool thing lord of the storm once per battle in your shooting phase emotech can call the storm pick an enemy um unit within 48 inches of Imatech, other than a character, and roll a d6. On a 2+, plus, that unit suffers many mortal wounds. Wait a second. Other than a character, and roll a d6. On a 2+, plus, that unit suffers that many mortal wounds. Then roll a d6 for each enemy unit that is within 6 inches of that unit. On a 6, the unit being rolled for suffers d3 immortal wounds. Uh, so it's once per battle. So it's not like something that, again, you're going to sell the farm on and go in on this. But it's just kind of a... 48 inches is a long ways. The wording on this like threw me off for a second, though, because it's just funny. Because it's on a 2+, plus, it goes off, but then it's also on that 2+, plus. So that's how many immortal wounds it does to that thing. Okay. And you can't pick a character. So, a little bit of limitations there. Um, looks like we're dropping a little bit of frames, guys, though, but it looks like it's mostly stable, so bear with me. Uh, we'll, we'll work on this in the interim. But that's kind of cool. It's okay. And then everything within six, a few more mortal wounds on a six. So, again, this is like their orbital bombardment. It's just a, it's, it's essentially attached to Emotech. Uh, but the two plus is pretty reliable, and that's kind of cool. So you can hit a tank. You know, I'm thinking late game, something, something's got three or four wounds on it, and you're like, uh, I really need to get rid of that. Yeah, I'm storming it. Boop. And it just goes ahead and dies. Um, that's how I would use it. I wouldn't use it to alpha strike something. I use it to clean something up that you need dead. Uh, like, oh, no, my destroyers. What did it say about time? Once per battle in your shooting phase. So it is your shooting phase. Okay. Uh, undying. Imotech the Stormlord regains D3 lost wounds at the beginning of your turn rather than one from his living metal ability. So this will be funny. Um, this is like classic games workshop. I know very well what they're trying to say here. It's pretty damn clear. Prepare for the nerd sitting across from you that's going to argue that he still gets to get, regain one from living metal and D3. But it, no, it, it says rather than. Anyways, I think that there's just one of those guys out there. I don't. I think his name's Kevin. So look out for a Kevin. Uh, Blood Swarm Necro Scarabs. You can reroll hit rolls of one for friendly units of Sawtech flayed ones that are within 12 inches of Imatech the Stormlord. So Imatech can give them um, plus one to hit. 
which is a big deal. He makes them reroll ones. Let me actually just go to flayed ones right now. Do they hit on threes? Because if they hit on threes, you're talking about hitting on twos, reeling ones. I'm not going to do this all the time, but I just want to see how this goes. Uh, yeah, their weapon skill three. So he makes them weapon skill two, rerolling ones. Uh, that's incredibly powerful. If 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 you're not aware, flayed ones also reroll to wound. So in in flayed ones units, and we'll get to their page in a little bit here, but I believe they go up to units of thirty. And I can, and there's just already really incredibly cool ways to, to use flayed ones. So I'm looking at this and I see it. I see the synergy. Imotech himself is not like a Gilliman or something like that where you're super excited about him being in the front lines all of a sudden. And, and flayed ones are front line units, by the way. But he can hold his own. Two up save, four up invul, tough five, regains all these wounds. He's not fun to fight. Um, and he's got a decent shooting attack and he's okay in close combat. Pretty damn good. Um, and the thing is that's a 12 inch aura by the way and it doesn't say one unit so he can only give my will oh no actually oh wow and here's the other thing here's the synergy that I'm looking at too so because of Farron of the Sawtech Dynasty rule he can actually use my will be done twice per turn I'm thinking two blocks of 30 flayed ones and he's just saying, you're hitting on twos, reeling ones. You're hitting on twos, reeling ones. You both um, are also getting plus one on the charge. Uh, and that's just amazing. That is pretty darn sick. So there's there's your guy. Grand Strategist. If your army is Battleforged, you receive one additional command point if Imatech, the Stormlord, is your Warlord. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. What it, what, one, of the, one of the only criticisms I'd say about these codexes is the named characters have a fixed warlord trait, but it doesn't say it on their page. You have to go back and list the named characters and their fixed warlord trait. I'm fine with it saying there, but it should say it here as well. I should go to Emotech's page, and when it says stuff like, if this guy's your warlord, he does X, Y, and Z, cool. But if he has a fixed warlord trait, tell me here. That's all I'm saying. So we'll have to look at that later, just remind me. And then he has phase shifter, like we said, so a four plus invul. I think I think this guy's amazing. I know he's one of the favorites. It's him, like a, a Nemesaur, that that people really like as the characters from uh, Deflated Ones. Go up to twenty. Okay, thank you, Captain Scrade, for correcting me on that. Still, twenty is a lot. It's pretty good. Um, but he's one of the big ones that you'll see, and I think it's awesome. Like I said, okay, close combat, okay shooting. Um, he's not your guy that like drops a knight or something like that. He's not Gilliman. He can't hop into a unit of whatever and come out victorious. But when things do get on top of him, he will be able to hurt them and he will be able to step back from them and then regain wounds, which is amazing. And the extra command point. Exactly. So, uh, I'm looking at the chat here. I'm, I, he's just a huge force multiplier. He's defensible. He heals. He's a good little mantle to put your warlord trade on. He does want to be in the front lines if you're doing the flayed one synergy thing. So that's where, you know, it gets a little bit tough. So let's get to Nemesaur. Uh, same Necron stuff here. Move five inches. Weapon skill, blitz skill two. Strength five, tough five, wound six. Attack three, leadership ten, save two plus. So that's kind of the character thing across the board. Although, as I say that, I think there's... It's basically just these two guys. Uh, and maybe the lords. Staff of light shooting. Range 12, assault three, strength five, minus two, damage one. Eh. Uh, staff light melee user minus two one damage so significantly worse in the shooting and melee department but that's not why people take nimbusaur he has counter tactics at the beginning uh he has living metal i think they all do so i'm, I'm probably not going to say it every time counter tactics at the beginning of your opponent's turn choose one enemy character within 12 inches of nimbusaur zandrek any aura abilities that character has cannot be used until the beginning of your opponent's next turn Womp womp. So it's it's cool, it's good, and it's still in the fluff as to what he used to do. But he used to take that ability and use it for himself, and that was all kinds of crazy fun. Um, so no, we don't get that old school fun thing there. Um, but it's still kind of cool. And so I'm gonna get to this in one second. I see someone in the chat saying, "My son's getting a Warhammer. Any recommendations on where to get started?" Uh, Azicus, thank you. First of all, Phoenix has got a, a great piece of advice there, but I actually made a whole video on, and Grimlock's right there opens it up on my YouTube, talking about all of that, um, how to get into the reading, the fluff, and the game itself. So make sure and check that out. Uh, so here's the thing. 
and I was, you know, I, I, bre- I breached this kind of discussion last time, and it wasn't as interesting to other people as it was to me, so I'll, I'll, maybe this one's not as fun for you guys. But the term aura abilities is not actually an official term. If you look in the big rule book, it doesn't say auras. Uh, it, it's listed, it, it's talked about in different ways from people to people, from different uh, codexes. They're not all referred to as auras. We all know what they're talking about when we say auras. Um, but for instance, a lot of times what, what it'll be described as is any, any friendly unit or model within 12 inches gains X, Y, and Z benefit. Um, call can heal a friendly Imperium vehicle within six inches. This originally came up in that area because Call's uh, one of his abilities is to add three inches to his auras, quote unquote which we very much so understand to be his reroll missing um, aura. But why is that not also his aura to heal? Or um, I think that's the only other one that he has. But that is arguably an aura as well, right? But it's not described that way. So anyways, kind of kind of interesting thing to look at. I see you guys discussing in the chat. I can't dive too far into that. But um, I could see some arguments coming there. He has the four plus invul as well. He has my will be done. Um, it's exactly the same. And then he has Transient Madness. Roll a D3 at the beginning of your turn and consult the following table. Choose a friendly Sawtech Infantry unit within six inches of Nemesis Zandrek to gain the relevant ability until the end of your next turn. One, Avengers of Fallen. Add one to the attack's characters, char- characteristic of the models in this unit. Quell the Rebellion. Improve the Bliss skill of models in the unit by one. Eh. Uh, solar mills charge reroll failed charge rolls for this unit so this is kind of a funny chart um swing my closer sure we're also dropping a little bit of frame so so if you guys are this is this is a rough stream we're having a good time uh it's a funny chart because number one and number three very much so speak to melee i mean they literally do it's it's reroll your charge and it's plus one attack and then number two is improve the ballistic skill by one so it's a little bit of an odd chart. I could see you taking Nemesaur and being like, I want him to buff up, to really mega buff up that Flayed One unit, give them another attack, um, or have them re-roll their charges, which just makes them very reliably getting into that melee. But what if you accidentally roll... I mean, you, it's random. You roll the two. Oh, okay, now they're plus one bliss skill, which you don't care about at all. Um, so not the end of the world, but I think that's a little bit of a... Uh, Womp womp moment there because the other thing here is true as well where it's not like you necessarily get to um take this guy put him next to your destroyers and be like give them plus one bliss skill no nope. two out of three is giving them one more attack or reroll charge which you don't care about um so it's uh, it's a little bit odd there it's a little bit odd odd and, it, and the reason it, it sticks out to me is that his other abilities are not super amazing the you take the aura from a character and they don't get to use it um it's nice but it's not you don't take him put him somewhere because you're like now i'm shutting down that aura and you're out of you're out of luck it's like no auras are really nice and that is a big impact but you're not going to pay 110 points or whatever it is for namasaur uh stick him in the front lines and then you know that's what you're that that's your gimmick that should be a supportive thing and then he should be a buffer which is what this chart is but like I said, um, it gets a little bit... It, it, uh, I don't know. I'd be interested to see what you guys think about that, if, if you're as down on that as I am. I wish he had another thing. I think he should also give like a, a command point. Or I, I like the Necrons for their, for their trickery. I thought that was a really cool part of 7th edition Necrons, where maybe this guy says, if you try to seize, you get to re-roll the seize, and that's the first time we see that pop up. Um, in the books. I know they're, I, I get the sense they're trying to stay away from that kind of thing, but something like that, you know what I mean? Like, give them a command point, uh, let them redeploy a single unit, something. Just give them, give them something interesting and, and, and goofy so that he can do that. Vargard Oberon. Vargard. Move 5, weapon skill 2, bliss skill 3, strength 5, tough 5, wound 6, attack 4, leash of 10, save 2+. plus. Um... He has the War Scythe, which is plus two strength, minus four, two damage. And it's just a War Scythe, by the way. Uh, so that will make appearances elsewhere in the Codex, and that is awesome. Um, 
Cleaving Counterblow. If Vargard Oberon is slain during the fight phase, do not remove the model until the end of the phase. He can still fight in this phase if he has not already done so. All right. We're not going to write home about it, but it's pretty cool. Something. Uh, the Lord's Will. Reroll wound rolls of one for friendly Sawtech infantry units that are within six of Vargard Oberon. So all of a sudden, we're getting that guy that gives you rerolls one. Now, this is a little bit interesting as well. Um, flayed ones already reroll to wounds, so this doesn't help them at all. Um, we're looking more at like Lich Guard and some of the other melee focused units, which there's not that many in the Necron Codex, so it's pretty much I don't know, what would you say? I mean, it's like you know, some of these characters uh, a Destroyer Lord with a War Scythe It's infantry though so, like, Lich Guard, their infantry. Uh, who else is infantry? Our, let me see if... Uh, Triarch Praetorians, their infantry. Okay, that's something. That's, like, the two units. Because Canaptic Wraiths are not infantry, as they shouldn't be. Satan Shards are not infantry. So, I'm really just looking to see... I might have already passed Destroyer Lords. Destroyers are infantry, so I, I imagine a destroyer lord would be. They're they're HQs, aren't they? Let me just see this real quick. Destroyer lord, infantry. Okay, so that's it. Uh, it doesn't help flayed ones at all, and you would only use it for triarch, praetorians, and lich guard and destroyer lords as your melee guys. Um, obviously, that means he can reroll it as well, and he has a war side, so that's, that's pretty cool. It's okay. It's it's your, I believe, and someone can immediately just, Jeff, you're an idiot. Uh, I think he's the only guy that lets you reroll ones to wound, so he definitely has some ability to be around there. You know what's interesting about this, though? I'm, I'm, I'm thinking two in the box. It's reroll wound rolls of one for friendly Sawtech infantry units that are within six of Vargan Oberon. It doesn't say in the shooting or, or assault phase, just reroll wounds. So, so that's pretty cool. Um, but I do think a lot of the I know. I, sh I should know this, guys. If I was a much more professional reviewer, I would know this. Des Destroyers already reroll to wound, don't they? Yeah. Oh, no, it's hit rolls. Hardwired hatred. No. They don't have that anymore. So, in 7th edition, Destroyers, by the way, used to have a lot of reroll to wound type stuff. They do not have it right now. So, the way to do that is with him. Um, so I could I could see him ending up being a backfield buffer in that in that regard. I don't. He is a melee guy, but I don't know that I would. Um, I would like. I don't know. If, maybe you are a tri Praetorian kind of guy, and, and that's or gal, and that's really what you're going for. That's something you really want, real bad. Anyways, that's one of his cool abilities. Uh, but the next two are the big ones for me. Ghost walk mantle. At the end of your movement phase, you can remove Vargard Oberon and a friendly Sawtech infantry unit within six inches of Vargard Oberon, other than Nemesis Andrek, uh, from the battlefield and set them up so that all models are within six inches of Nemesis Andrek and more than one inch from any enemy model. So you can't, you can't put them into melee, but if you can get Nemesis into the, the enemy lines, which there is incentive to do that ish, like I was saying, if that was Emotech, if the rule was for Emotech, we're talking about the most baller synergy across like 1,200 points of your list that I've ever seen. But it's Nemesor, so... Eh. All of a sudden, you're looking at that chart, you're, you're grabbing an aura, so you're starting to see some synergy there from Vargard. It's not just Nemesor. So Nemesor's in the front lines. You did bring him. You're hoping for a 1 or 3 on that chart um, to buff up your flayed ones or, or destroyer lords or whatever it is you're doing with your, your stuff there and trying to charge and get more attacks you're grabbing someone's aura which is really nice so you know if you're facing that Gilliman you're facing um, I mean the, the, every army has auras there's just you're just shutting that down um, then all of a sudden you're also teleporting in a, this this scary unit that you wanted to get over there and the wording on this is pretty particular. You have to be more than one inch away and entirely within six, but that doesn't mean you have to be nine inches away. So you're teleporting, and all of a sudden you're two inches away. You're going to make that charge, obviously. It's it's literally impossible not uh, to, to fail that. 
um, and you're on top of your opponent. Or it's a shooting one. That's the other thing, too. You don't necessarily have to bring in a melee unit. Maybe you got this... Because Necron shooting is fairly short range. You pop in a, a big blob of something there, give them all the buffs, and light them up, and then have the characters behind to, uh, you know, buff them, protect them, and counter charge, maybe? That's kind of cool. Then he has the Vargard's duty, and I feel really weird saying Vargard. I'm sure I'm, I'm sure it's supposed to be it, Jeff. It's Vargard, okay? I don't know. Roll a d6 each time Nemesis Zandrek loses a wound, whilst he is within three inches var of Vargard Oberon. On a two plus, Oberon can intercept that hit. Zandrek does not lose a wound, but Oberon suffers a mortal wound. Okay. Um, what I like about this is the word "can" here, so you can kind of. This is one of the only ways you can wound manipulate in Eighth Edition. Because if something in a unit takes a wound, which, you know, characters, this isn't as big of a deal, obviously, but uh, you don't then take another wound on a, a guy further back. It's just that guy takes until he dies, the next guy takes until he dies, etc., etc. But all of a sudden, you're divvying up wounds between these two guys. They both have um, six wounds. So that's 12 wounds that you're dicing up between the two of them, and they both heal each turn. So you're starting to see a theme here. There's reanimation protocols, there's healing wounds through living metal, there's a bodyguard for one of your big ass buffing characters. Okay. Vargard is actually pronounced Kenneth. Thank you, Wizard of Boss. I I was saying that completely wrong. That is I appreciate that. Uh next character, Illuminor Zerus. Six inch movement. This guy is a he's hauling butt. Weapon skill plus skill three, though. He pays for it. Strength four, tough four, wounds five, attacks four, leadership ten, save three plus. So a little bit quicker, but a little bit easier to kill across the board. Um, he's a crypt tech, so they're just a little bit more of the thinking type. He has the Eldritch Lance, 36 inch range, assault one, strength eight, minus four, d6, aka Melta, but he doesn't get the Melta abilities. Under abilities, just got a dash, so there's no, no reroll to wound or anything like that. It's just kind of cool. Uh, Eldritch Lance in melee, strength user, minus two, one damage. Womp womp. Uh, I kind of would have liked it if it was still minus four d6 damage. Um, I'm, I, I like the little surprise okay guys. You know what I mean? Like the we talked about this with the Oniger gauntlet um, in Tau. Like you're, you're not gonna build a melee army around Zerus here, but you'd be kind of cool if he was like, yeah, you're damn right with my four attacks. But okay, whatever. Master Technomancer. Add one to all reanimation protocol rolls for models from friendly Necrons units within three inches of Luminar Zerus. A unit cannot benefit from both the Master Technomancer and Technomancer abilities in the same turn. Um, I assume, yeah. So other other uh, Crypt Techs have the Technomancer rule. It's just add one. So they're, they're like, hey guys, we realize in 7th edition some of you cheese dick Necron players were trying to argue that you had like reanimation protocols going off on a 2 plus and stuff like that. It's like, no. We want it to get pretty good, but not so incredibly amazing that nobody's never dying. Um, so yeah, not not bad. Mechanical augmentation. At the end of your movement phase, you can choose a friendly Necrons warrior or immortal unit within one inch of Luminar. Zerus, roll a d3 to see what characteristic modifier models in that unit gain for the rest of the battle. For the rest of the battle. Very important here. So let me read that again. At the end of your movement phase, you can choose a friendly Necrons warrior or a mortal unit within one inch of Illuminar Zerus. Roll a d3 to see what characteristic modifier models in that unit gain for the rest of the battle. So if you have like three blocks of warriors, or you've got your two blocks of warriors and a couple blocks of immortals, you move him down the line, and he's just like the fairy godmother, just like, I give you plus one strength and then over to the next unit plus one toughness you don't get to choose you have to roll for it but they're pretty good one is plus one strength two is plus one toughness three is blissful improved by one um the only thing that's kind of sad about this is that they are a little bit redundant the plus one bliss skill is found in my will be done um so if you have an infantry squad back there, chances are they're near one of these characters and they have nothing else to give this to except for infantry units. You'll still take it. Don't get me wrong. Okay, it's still pretty cool. It gives you options. You're hoping for plus one toughness because all of a sudden you've got a unit that's going up to tough five. Um, and it just says it, it is it is only warriors or, or immortals. So you, you don't get to fool around with this too much. Even plus one strength's okay, though. They're strength four. I think they go up to five. So, I mean, that's... You know, you're wounding a Space Marine on a 3+. plus. That ain't bad, man. That's okay. 
And then it does specify a unit can only be the target of this ability once per battle. So don't, I know that someone right now is sitting there and they're like, oh my God, I could make a toughness, I could make a toughness nine unit of immortals by turn five, right? Did I do the math correctly? No, it does stop. Your fantasy is over, okay? Slam the door on that boner. It's not happening. Um, but it's still pretty cool. And like I said, he's got a decent shot, by the way. He's shooting a range 36 melta shot. Um, he is giving you better reanimation rolls, and you're doing that with Cryptex anyways. And then he has this chart. So, okay, pretty cool. Um, like I was saying, though, none of these characters are necessarily like the auto takes, I feel. Maybe Emotech. Um, but for the most part, we're not... You're not looking at what I like about these characters is they're making you want to buffet them. You're like, I want Zerus. I want him in the back line making my troop blocks that much tougher to kill. And he's shooting out Meltus, who's good anti armor. Um, I want Vorgard for the for the the jump to Nemesar trick. I want Nemesar to have the, the jump to Nemesar trick. I like the idea of Emotech being my warlord. Uh, but wait, there's more. Orokin the Diviner. This guy was really fun in 7th edition. Unfortunately, a lot of my friends were like the mega tryhard Necron players. So they were attaching him to Wraith units and then trying to have them jump up to strength 300 and stuff like that. Orokin the Diviner. He is also a Cryptek. He's move 5, weapon skill 3, weapon skill 3, strength 4, tough 4, wounds 5, attacks 2, leash 10, save 4 plus. So something between Orokin and Zerus went wrong and Orokin got the worst end of the deal on the save category. But then there's Orokin Empowered. And I'll read his rule. The stars are right. Roll a d6 at the start of each of your turns. If the result is less than the current battle round number, Orokin uses the Orokin Empowered profile for the rest of the game. So on turn one, you'd have to roll less than a one. You can't do it. On turn two, you need to roll a one. Turn three, you need to roll a two. So on and so forth. Um, but the Empowered is as follows. Move five, weapon skill two, blitz skill two, strength seven, toughness seven, Wounds, 7. Attacks, 4. Leadership, 10. 4+. plus. So this guy just downs a just a bucket of steroids and becomes pretty awesome. He's got the Staff of Tomorrow, which is Strength User, minus 3, D3 damage. And you can reroll failed hit rolls for this weapon. Uh, so he becomes a little bit of a beat stick. Um, he also adds 1 to Reanimation Protocols. And friendly infantry units within six of him uh, have a five plus invulnerable save. Just cuz. Just because that's pretty cool. So, not bad. Um, pretty cool, I believe. I read it somewhere. Why does it not say it here? Maybe, it, maybe I'm making this up, but I believe it said. So, like, let's say you got him down to one wound and then you roll for Orkin Empowered. He doesn't shoot up to seven wounds, he carries over the wounds. I'm pretty sure I read that somewhere, but. I don't know. I'm not seeing it now, so maybe I made that up. And and Racker the Traveler. And Rakir. Anna, how would you say A N R A K Y R? A N R A K Y R. And Rakir. That sounds way better. She probably said that correctly. Okay. And Rakir is an overlord. He has a uh, five inch movement, two plus, two plus, strength six, tough five, wound six, attacks three, leadership 10, save three plus. He has the Tachyon Arrow, range 120 inches. Assault one, strength 10, minus five, D6 damage. This weapon can only be used once per battle. Fair enough. Otherwise you would literally just stick him in the corner and he would be chucking Tachyon Arrows at you. He's got a War Scythe, so plus two strength, minus four, two damage. Uh, everyone has Living Metal. I just want to reiterate that. I have not been reading that for like the last five characters. They all have it, so don't don't hear this and be like, Jeff, Orkin doesn't have what? No, they all have it. I will tell you when they don't. Lord of the uh, pre pff, Lord of the Prion Legions. Add one to the attacks characteristic of friendly Necron infantry units within three inches of Anrakir, the Traveler. Every time I hear that, I'm thinking of the melee units for the Necrons. And they have a lot of this, like, plus to melee, which is kind of interesting. That a lot of these guys are, are gaining these buffs of, like, plus one attack, reroll charges, plus one to charge. Like, they really want Necrons to assault people. Um, there's something to that, guys. Mind in the machine. 
At the start of your shooting phase, choose an enemy vehicle model within 12 inches of Andrakir the Traveler and roll a d6 on a 4+. plus. Choose one of the vehicle's weapons. You may shoot with that weapon or at another enemy unit. The weapon fire fires using the vehicle's ballistic skill. Okay, so you can grab a Shadow Sword. Um, that's obviously where you go with it, right? Uh, unfortunately, what's going to happen 9 times out of 10 is you're grabbing a Scout Sentinel's Flamer and you are torching two Catachan guys and they're like, oh no, stop it, it's warm. Um, but can we can we just dare to dream here for a second? No, you're playing an APOC game. You find a way to deep strike him next to a Warlord Titan. The Warlord Titan turns and shoots a Reaver. The Reaver explodes, killing half the army. Your opponent concedes. Look who it was. Your opponent was Heidi Klum. You guys get married and the rest is history, as they say. Um, that is the dream, of course. Phase Shifter, he's got a four plus invul save. And he has my will be done as well. Um, it's exactly the same. I'm not even going to read it. It's the same as earlier. Uh, but that's pretty cool. Not bad. We'll get to the point cost of these characters, but for the most part, they're all fairly inexpensive, by the way. So that's the nice thing about them. They're, they're sturdy, decent damage dealers. They have cool little tricks, and they're about 100 and, you know, some odd points. Trazen the Infinite. Move 5, 2+, plus, 2+, plus, Strength 5, Tough 5, Wound 6, Attacks 3, Leadership 10, save 3+. plus. Um, all the named characters, by the way, can only be the only one in your army. I hope that goes without saying. That's that's true across the board. That's just Warhammer, but just making sure. He has a Empathic Obliterator. It's a melee weapon, plus 2 strength, minus 1, D3 damage. If a character is slain by an attack from this weapon, each enemy unit within 6 of the slain character suffers D3 mortal wounds. I like that. That's what I love that this codex does this. Is that mega powerful? Do you write a list around that? No, you do not. Is that freaking cool when it comes up and has an impact on the game and is competitive? Yes, I love that. And uh, as we're seeing throughout the Necron Codex, it just has so many fun little things that fit within eighth. They're not overpowered. Um, you know, you're not getting this overwhelming sense of like, oh my God, I know exactly the, the list I'm writing. It's all about that. It's not really like that. But to be fair, for most people, that's the case. But you are getting these little cool tricks. You are getting these little pieces of flavor. It's a different kind of weapon. I, I'm, I'm really enjoying that they're doing that. Uh, he has the face shifter as well, so 4 plus invul. He has my will be done. Uh, he has surrogate hosts. If Trazen the Infinite is slain, roll a d6. On a 2 plus, you may choose another friendly Necron infantry character other than characters that you can only include once in your army, so other another named character. Remove that model as if it were slain and place Trazen in its place with D3 wounds remaining. If no such characters remain or you roll to one, remove Trazen the Infinite as a casualty as normal. So, unfortunately, you know, the, the characters that kind of qualify for that are your Destroyer Lords. They are your just a straight-up Lord, which I don't know that you would take one of those. We'll get to that. Overlord. Cryptek. Okay. Actually, there's some guys you might take that, that you would um, probably replace with him. But that's kind of cool. Again, is it mega ridiculous over the top? Nope. But it's pretty cool. So then we get to the Catacomb Command Barge. Move 12. Weapon skill 2. Bliss skill 2. Strength 5. Tough 6. Wounds 8. Attacks 3. Leadership 10. Save 3+. plus. Um, it comes stock with a Goss Cannon and it is ridden by an overlord armed with the Staff of Light. So we talked about the Staff of Light, but just to refresh you, it's strength user minus two, one damage. Eh. Uh, it does have a shooting attack, which is just assault three within range 12, strength five, minus two, one damage. The Goss Cannon is range 24, heavy three, strength six, minus three, D3 damage. Pretty cool. Um, but there's just so many fun abilities for the Catacomb Command Barge that I like a lot. So, of course, it has Living Metal. Wave of Command. At the beginning of your turn, choose a friendly Dynasty Infantry unit within 12 of this model. Add one to advance charge and hit rolls for that unit until the beginning of your next turn. A unit can only be chosen once for Wave of Command or My Will Be Done once in each turn. Womp womp. So this is like a weaker My Will Be Done. And it specifically says that you cannot double up on this with this and My Will Be Done. Which, to be fair, you know, you're gaining two attacks is all it would have been. Um, all right. But here's the real secret sauce, and for those of you that play the Index, you know what I'm about to talk about, Quantum Shielding. Each time this, this model fails a saving throw, roll a d6. If the result is less than the damage inflicted by that attack, the damage is ignored.
quantum shielding cannot prevent damage caused by mortal wounds. Okay, so it doesn't affect that, but for those of you that need these dots connected here, that means if you're hit by something that does six damage, you cannot be hurt by it. Oh, it has to be less than. So I guess on a six, you do suffer it, but you can just use a reroll. But on a five or less, you do not get hurt by it. Someone hits you with Melta, and they're like, oh, baby, I'm really hoping for it. And they're like, wait a second, I'm hoping for two. Maybe, uh, if I want to get greedy, a three. Otherwise, you're just not going to get any of those saves. Um, so that's pretty amazing. Uh, I like that a lot. Quantum Shielding is really fun. It appears on, I believe, all the Necron vehicles, but that's cool. Resurrection Orb. If this model has a Resurrection Orb, once per battle, immediately after you have made your reanimation protocols, Rolls at the beginning of the turn, you can make reanimation protocol rolls for models from a friendly dynasty enemy unit within three inches of this model. Let me read that again, because I think I'm confused. If this model has a resurrection orb once per battle, immediately after you have made your reanimation protocols, rolls at the beginning of the turn, you can make reanimation protocols rolls. It's just a weird way to word that. I don't like that at all. But what it's essentially saying is you can roll again. I just, I don't know why you wouldn't say it that way. I would have said, resurrection orb immediately after making your normal re you know reanimation protocol rolls with the orb once per battle you can make those rolls again or make a new set of rolls it's funny though because i say that it's super easy to do that but then i think of all the warhammer nerds out there who like take any kind of weird wording at all and suddenly they're you know it's telling me to murder my neighbor explodes if this model is reduced to zero wounds roll a d6 before removing it from the battlefield on a six it explodes and each unit within three inches suffers a mortal wound. A mortal wound. I kind of like, and it's interesting, that there's different like versions of explosions across the board. There's the guys that go six inches for D6. There's the guys that go three inches for D3. Uh, for some reason, this thing blows up, blows up very gingerly. It's just, a, it's just a single mortal wound, everything within three. Overlord, movement five. Weapon skill 2, blitz skill 2, strength 5, tough 5, wounds 5, attacks 3, leadership 10, save 3 plus. Um, not a whole lot to add here. We haven't talked about the Void Blade. It is a melee weapon that's strength user minus 3, 1 damage. Each time the bear fights, he can make one additional attack with this weapon. So we'll have to look at the points, but perhaps it's cheaper. Gets you another attack. The minus 3 is nice. The 1 damage is meh. Uh, you can take a Void Scythe. It's strength times 2, minus 4, 3 damage. But when attacking with this, you subtract one from the hit roll. So it's kind of like your bigger, it's your hammer. Are you guys really talking about my thighs right now? Is that what we're doing? All right, Yonker man. I mean, you're that demographic. Just so you know, of the 200 people that are watching us so, so far right now, you, it's like you and two of the guys that my thighs are, you're the demographic for that. I'm not saying you should feel bad about it. I like it. There's something for, there's a little something for everybody. In my case, there's a lot. Uh, they can get a resurrection orb as well phase shifter and my will be done so just an alternative uh, HQ uh, and keep in mind the command barge it just has an overlord inside of that they didn't give the treatment I thought that would, I thought that would have been interesting they didn't give the treatment um, as far as I can tell well I, I guess I'm wording this the wrong way it kind of like it kind of is the gray knight um, baby carriage right the grandmaster inside the the suit the dread knight i was about to say it'd be cool if you could put like nemesaur in one of those or something like that but that is unprecedented then there's the lord move five weapon skill three blitz skill three strength five tough five wounds four attacks three leadership ten save three plus he has a staff of light this is your cheaper hq um same kind of weapons we were talking about there is the hyper phase sword i don't think i say anything about that it's strength plus one, minus three, one damage. That's kind of cool. Eh, it's kind of cool. Um, he has the, the, the Lord's Will. Reroll wound rolls of one for friendly dynasty infantry units that are within six inches of this model. So I misspoke earlier. I said that, the, that one of the only ways to get that was through that other guy. Nope, here it is. You can get it through a Lord. It is specific to the dynasty and infantry, which is fine. That's pretty much status quo. Um for 8th edition he has a res he can have a resurrection orb I think you have to pay to give it to him uh, but it's just cheap HQ and he gets you to reroll ones um, to wound which keep in mind unless I'm missing something and, and I'll take a look at the destroyers but I don't think they naturally reroll to wound like they did um, 
in seventh edition. They used to be strength five and they were rend well, AP three is what we used to call it. Um, but they rerolled to wound. And I think did they do that just it was like destroyer protocols or it was the the Decurion that gave it to him. Either way, um that's not here as far as I can tell. We'll we'll take a look though. Then there's the Cryptek. This is just your basic Cryptek. He's got a Staff of Light. Move 5, Weapon Skill 3, Blitz Skill 3, Strength 4, Tough 4, Wounds 4, Tax 1, Leadership 10, Save 4+. Plus. Um, they have Chronomatron. Units within 3 inches of friendly models with Chronomatron have a 5 plus or vulnerable save. Technomancer. Then he has the connect, uh, the Kineptic Cloak. A model equipped with the Kineptic Cloak has a move characters of 10 and gains the Fly keyword... In addition, at the start of your turn, you can select one friendly dynasty model that has the living metal ability that is within three inches of this model. That model regains D3 lost wounds rather than one. So he's like a flying apothecary. He's an absolute turd muffin in close combat. His shooting is non-existent. I feel like the cryptic carriers do everything he does but better. But then specifically, the canoptic cloak is kind of cool. Because um, it just makes them heal d3 as opposed to one so that's kind of nice is it a superhero cloak people are talking about this it's in the forge bane box i think is the is the big cape we're all talking about it's all right um with it with necrons you're going to want you know multiple battalions and stuff like that so um filling out some of those hq slots with some of these lesser guys you're going to have a cryptech maybe you're going to have a lord or overlords or something like that because rerolling ones to wound is nice healing people better is cool giving a five plus plus bubble is pretty cool something to think about destroyer lord movement 10 weapon skill three blitz skill three strength five tough six wound six attacks four leadership 10 save three plus he comes stock with a staff of light but you're going to replace that every single time with probably a war scythe war sith or scythe hard wired hatred you can reroll hit rolls of one for this model um and keep in mind he is infantry even though the model doesn't have any legs and is a floating vacuum cleaner um he gets to be called infantry so you're you're looking a lot of ways to make him hitting on twos rerolling ones so very reliably hitting um yep one skill plus skill three but like I said, with access to all kinds of different ways to get that up. Four attacks, but then there's a lot of ways to get him to attacks five as well. Um, so five attacks hitting at strength seven, minus four, two damage. Hitting on twos, rerolling ones. And then maybe you got a guy to reroll one to wound. Uh, that That's a murder machine. And then he has, a, he has a rule called United in Hatred. You can reroll wound rolls of one in the shooting phase for this model and models from friendly Dynasty Destroyer and Dynasty Heavy Destroyer units within six. Okay, so that's where we get that. So you have a Destroyer Lord around a bunch of destroyers. Uh, it's not reroll all wounds because this is eighth edition and we don't want people feeling too, too bad about themselves. But it is reroll wounds of one, and that's not bad, especially when, you, when we take a look at Heavy Destroyers and what they're shooting in a second. Flactory. A model with Flactory regains D3 lost wounds at the beginning of your turn rather than one from their living metal ability damn a lot of these guys i mean he's six wounds and he's healing d3 that's pretty good that's pretty good yep good point in the chat by the way because they these guys are infantry they gain the benefit of uh cover so if you just tow in this son of a bitch in a bush all of a sudden he's a two up save on a tough six model do it do it every time you can also give him a, a resurrection orb Necron Warriors. Move 5. Weapon skill 3. Blood skill 3. Strength 4. Tough 4. Wounds 1. Attacks 1. Leadership 10. Save 4 plus. So 4 plus. Womp womp. But that's kind of what they were known for. Because they get back up. Only one attack. So if you're getting charged. You know. You're just. Uh, you're hitting them. Unless they gained plus 1 strength. Whoa. Um, and then they have reanimation protocols. They do not have living metal. As they only have one wound. So I do have to point that out. But we get the Goss Flare. Range 24, Rapid Fire 1, Strength 4, AP minus 1, Damage 1. Pretty cool. Your Necron Warriors come stock with a much better bolter. It is Rapid Fire 1, so that's basically exactly a bolter. Range 24. Uh, but AP minus 1 on your, on your basic troops. And I really like lists that include at least a block of 20 of these guys. 
Um, they're still a little bit pricey. We'll take a look at the back in a second. But, you know, so going up to 40 is probably not the greatest. Um, and then there is a dynasty. We're at half range. They're minus one additional rend. So now we're talking about Goss Flares doing minus two on the rend. Again, is there somebody out there that right now is scouring eBay to buy up every warrior he can find because he's making this really cool 140 Necron warrior list? No. Actually, yes, that guy probably is out there, but is it going to do well? Probably not. But it's cool. Your basic troops are good. Immortals. Um, same stat line, except their save is 3+. plus. Literally only one attack. That's actually the only thing that separates them. Um, they can have the Goss Blaster, which is strength 5, minus 2, 1 damage. Uh, rapid Fire 1 still, range 24. Or they can have the Tesla Carbine, which is Assault 2, strength 5, AP 0, 1 damage. Each hit roll of a 6+, plus with this weapon, causes 3 hits instead of 1. So not three additional, but three hits instead of one. Um, I'm not wild about it because it's only assault two. So, you know, you're rolling, well, uh, you got a unit of five. It's 10 dice. You can roll like one or two sixes. Gets you four extra hits. Eh, it's okay. Um, I still like that lists include immortals basically as like uh, just the other other white meat basically. Lich guard. Um, movement 5, weapon skill 3, blitz skill 3, strength 5, tough 5, wounds 2, attacks 2, leadership 10, save 3+. plus. So quite a bit better. They can come with the hyperphase sword at plus 1 strength, minus 3, 1 damage. But why did I even say that? Because they can take the war scythe. Melee, plus 2, so strength 7, minus 4, 2 damage. They have reanimation protocols, of course. Dispersion shield, a model equipped with a dispersion shield has a 4 plus invulnerable save. I think that was a 3 plus in 7th, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Guardian Protocols. Roll a d6 each time a friendly Dynasty character loses a wound whilst they are within 3 of this unit. On a 2 plus, a model from this unit can intercept that hit. The character does not lose a wound, but this unit suffers a mortal wound. Bodyguards. Bodyguards with war size. They can hit pretty hard. Um, that's all right. I was talking about this like maybe in maybe in conjunction with Nemesaur for the teleport over, and then just have these guys jump on top of stuff. The tough five is really nice. The two wounds is pretty cool. Um, Necrons have a lot of access to plus one weapon skill and bliss skills, so they're hitting on twos and a lot of access to rerolling ones. It does take a little bit of the the buffing around there, but that's pretty cool. Um, the unit uh, it can go up to ten. Are you doing 10? I don't know. Death marks. Um, movement 5, weapon skill 3, blitz skill 3, strength 4, tough 4, wounds 1, attacks 1, leisure 10, 3 plus save. They come with a synaptic disintegrator. <clears throat> I think my voice cracked, but that's awesome. Range 24, rapid fire 1, strength 4, AP 0, damage 1. This weapon may target a character, even if it's not the closest enemy unit. Each time you roll a wound roll of a 6 for this weapon, the target suffers a mortal wound in addition to any other damage. So... It is the sniper rifle. Um, it's rapid fire. It's only range 24, so that's kind of how they get around this. I, I still kind of would have liked this to have been a minus one or strength five. Um, it's specific to the death marks. This is their only sniper. It's like a legendary sniper unit in the game in, in its whole, and it just is basic sniper on a weapon sk uh, blitz skill three model. So it's like, yeah, you can buff them up. I know I just said that, but the rules below this kind of make it where it's like you don't necessarily want to do that because it's kind of cool what they do hunters from hyperspace during deployment you can set up this unit in a hyperspace obliet instead of placing it on the battlefield at the end of your turn movement phase uh at the end of your movement phase is the death marks can slip back into reality send set them up anywhere on the battlefield is within nine inches so they, they deep strike ethereal interception when an enemy unit is set up other than during deployment or when disembarking, you can immediately set up a unit of death marks that was set up in hyperspace Ubliet, on the battlefield anywhere more than 9 inches away um, from any enemy models and within 12 of the enemy that is ju that's just been set up. That's kind of weird. Just make it more than 9. Why, why within 12? That's a weakness immediately. I, I don't like that. You can then make a shooting attack with this unit as if it were your shooting phase, but this attack must target the enemy unit that was just set up. So at face value, 
not super amazing but what i really like about this is that because they are sniper um when your opponent has that chaos sorcerer or arimon or something like that and they're like how many death marks do you have and you're like i have a unit of 10 because i hate you and they're like oh so when he deep strikes in yes so it kind of messes with their head but that's what i don't like i don't like that you have to be within 12 because then there's a way for them to block you if you were able to use your full range 24 then there's nothing you can do to stop them for the most part from just being your character killer unit which is what they're supposed to be that's how they should be used um but this weird additional rule nine away and within 12 um, I don't think this is going to connect with a lot of you as to why that's so bad, but it is. It is actually bad. That unit then gets pounced on and killed. It makes them a liability. It makes it makes you de-incentivize deep striking them. Like the ethereal interception idea is cool um, in a vacuum, but there's so many scenarios where it's just a bad idea all of a sudden. Um, or you just can't even set them up. Like I can drop my character in my backfield and they're like, ethereal! Uh, what's your other units? And you're like, two units of gene stealers and they're like yeah because are they gonna are they gonna ethereal interception anything other than literally just a character that's important no no they're not so i'm pretty down on this um i feel like that's an unnecessary nerf because death marks by the way traditionally there's too much rng there okay 10 of them shooting rapid fire one that's 20 shots if you do a full unit of 10 that's amazing um, but more often than not, because of the timing of when they come in, they're not getting the plus one blister skill, so they're only hitting on threes. They're rerolling ones if there's this weird confluence of stars aligning where you're next to a lord or something. Um, and then they're only doing mortal wounds on a six. So on average, you're doing like two mortal wounds, maybe three, and then you're wounding them six, seven times or something like that, which is a decent amount of damage, but we're talking about a full unit of ten that you only maybe got to place. I don't like all that. I think that's too much. I personally would have said they, they have to be more than nine away. Done. End of line. And then people would be like, but that's that's way too powerful. You'd be able to snipe characters. Yes, but that Necron player invested a 10-man unit of death marks into countering that. They're going to play four or five games out of six where it doesn't it almost doesn't ever come into effect. Um, against my list, do it. I don't give a shit. You're, you're coming down to shoot my shield captain? He wants you to do it. His chest drinks your synaptic disintegrator laser beams. He wants it. He shaves his beard by it. But it's okay. It's not the end of the world. It's not the worst thing in the world. So if, if you, again, you're that guy and you're the, you're sitting there with your like your army of entirely marked, uh, god dang, what are they called? Death marks. And I'm over here hating on them. Don't worry. Oh, wow. Psyop says, holy... I'm going to read this one out. This is fine. This is a good comment. This is a very smart guy. He says, holy hell, I haven't been here in two years. When did you get so good looking? No, really, though. I really want to get into Warhammer, but it seems like you need a, a King's Ransom to play. Is there a cheaper way to get into it? Someone please link that man to my video I made. Thank you for the kind words. Thank you for stopping by, buddy. Flayed Ones. I do like Flayed Ones. So if you thought we were going to just talk about how sad I am about death marks and leave it at that, you're wrong. Flayed Ones. Move 5, Weapon Skill 3, Blitz Skill 6. Who cares? They don't shoot. Strength 4, Tough 4, Wounds 1, Attacks 3. Leadership 10, Save 4+. Plus. Um, and yeah, they go up to units of 20. The Flayed Claws are Strength User, which is 4. That's respectable. AP nothing. Okay. Damage 1. You can re-roll Failed Wound Rolls for this weapon. Boom! These are your Mulcher guys. Um... Now, remember, we have all kinds of ways to get them plus one attacks. Now we're talking about four attacks on the model. We have ways to get their weapon skill to two plus. In fact, my will be done does both of those things. Um, I, no, maybe not the attack one. Anyways, I'm, all these rules are jumbling up in my head. You get them plus one on the charge, and then they have some special rules. Flesh Hunger. If any flayed ones slay any models in a unit, that unit subtracts one from its leadership characteristic, characteristic until the end of the turn. So really good at chopping up chafe. Haunting horrors. Um, they can deep strike. 
that's I'm not going to read that whole thing. It's just something about how they come out of a charnel pocket dimension. They're scary. Pretty cool, though. And like we said, there's some synergy there with Nemesaur, I believe it was. Um, hell, e Emotech helps them out. No, it's Emotech that helps them out. Oh, it's Emotech that gives two units of these guys plus one attack is what it was. Um, this is this is this is part of the meta is what I'm going to be seeing. Um, I'll tell you what the hardcore players were talking about, but a block or two of flayed ones deep striking in and being joined up by characters, um, giving them all the buffs and them jumping on top of you. Strength five shred, hitting on twos, rerolling ones. I think of that. Four attacks each, 20, 20 guys, so that's 80 attacks. Hitting on twos, rerolling ones, so that's what, 76, 75 hits. Uh, if you're going up against a model that's tough four or lower, which is almost everything in the game, you're wounding on threes, and you can get them reroll ones, by the way. Oh, no, they reroll everything, excuse me. Forget the ones, they reroll re everything. You're talking about 70 wounds. You're talking about 65 wounds or something in that ballpark. Um, that's monstrous. That almost brings down a knight, right? Just one block of that can almost bring down a knight by themselves. Amazing. Um, and that's, they're just, they are just, uh, they're your light little infantry guys. Save four plus, not great. They have reanimation protocols. Um, I'm, I'm in love with them. You can also put them in the Necron Croissants as well and drop them down. Triarch Praetor uh, Praetorian, excuse me. Movement 10. Weapon skill 3, blitz skill 3, strength 5, tough 5, wounds 2, attack 2, leadership 10, save 3 plus. They have a particle caster. We haven't talked about that yet. It's range 12, pistol 1, strength 6, AP dash, damage 1. All right. Rod of Covenant, shooting, range 12, assault 1, strength 5, minus 3, 1 damage. That's what they can use in melee. It's the strength user, minus 3, uh, 1 damage. Or they can use a void blade, minus 3, 1 damage. I don't see too much of this. They're the jump guys. They're pretty cool. Um, they have a purpose unshakable. This unit automatically passes morale tests. So they're, they're fearless, essentially. They have reanimation. That's okay. They are fast. They still are infantry, so they gain a lot of the buffs. But their access to weapons is kind of light. Like, their shooting is not super impressive. Um, just one shot off of all of them. Strength 5, minus 3, but only one damage. So, you know, kapow! And they do, they do like, four wounds to a guy. And he's like, oh, no, I made three of the saves. And they're like, all right, that's what we do. Then they jump on top of you, and if they had a lot of attacks, I'd be impressed with their weapons, but they don't. Um, only having two attacks, uh, and unless you use a Void Blade, the Void Blade gives you a third attack, but even that, it's all damage one, it's all minus three, um, it's all strength user, so strength five. Uh, let me just tell you from experience, um, my custodians are taking off their Misericordias uh, after Adepticon, because that did almost nothing. These are minus three versus their minus two, but the one damage is strength five. It's just not that impressive. It's so track Praetorians. Blow them out, okay? Put them on the shelf. They look pretty. Hallelujah, I see you in chat. I know you have 20 of them. You're not going to use them. You understand? Wait until uh, ninth edition. Ninth edition, I've heard rumors are going to be super sick. Otherwise, nope, your points should go elsewhere. Triarch Stalker. This is the big spider robot, dude. It's equipped with a heat ray and massive forelimbs. Its movement is 10 inches when at full health. Its weapon skill is 3 and blitz skill 3 all at full health. It does degrade, and it starts at 10 wounds. It does degrade at 5 wounds, though, so that's the standard. You drop to half, and that's where it starts to get a little bit more poopy. Um, strength 7, tough 6, wound 10, attack 3, leadership 10, save 3+. plus. It does have quantum shielding, but the tough six on this is a little bit of a stinker and having only 10 wounds. It's a couple of bad anti-tank rolls away from just being dead, just gone. Um, but with the quantum shielding, I guess what I just said is almost completely not true. I guess the other, there's a lot of like heavy bolters or strength six guns that are a little bit more of the DACA, like a couple of uh, assault cannons at this and it just gets pretty bad. So I don't know, I'm a little bit down on it. The heat ray, you choose one of the two profiles. So at eight at eight inches, it's heavy two d six, strength five minus one, one damage, and it automatically hits. So it's a two d six, strength five minus one, heavy flamer. Focused range twenty four, heavy two, strength eight minus four, d six damage. If the if they're at half, um, when inflicting damage with it, 
discard the lowest. You roll two dice. So it's Melta, basically. Ah. Particle Shredder. 24 inches, heavy 6, strength 7, minus 1, D3 damage. Now we're cooking. Twin Heavy Goss Cannon, range 36, heavy 2, strength 9, minus 4, D6 damage. And then Massive Forelimbs, uh, user minus 1, D3. Ugh. This model may replace its heat ray with a particle shredder or twin heavy Gauss cannon. So I think that's a little bit of a missed opportunity. You could have made it like a pretty cool gun platform and given it the option to add one of those to it or something. But because you have to replace the heat ray, um, I don't know. You're not putting out that many shots. The heat ray is probably your better bet anyways because it's a 2d6 flamer that then also has uh, a range 24 melta gun that's two shots. What are you comparing that to? A pseudo DACA, because it's heavy, six. Strength seven, minus one, D3 damage, uh, particle shredder. But it's heavy, so if it moves at all, you're hitting on fours. Um, it's not infantry, it doesn't get any of those benefits. So, like, literally hitting on fours. So you hit two or three times, and you wound one, two, maybe three times. But only at minus one. I'm going to give you a big, I'm going to give you a big fat pass on this. Uh, one of the unique rules to it, though, is targeting relay. You can reroll hit rolls of one for any friendly Necron units that make a shooting attack against a unit that has already been attacked by any Triarch Stalker in the phase. The problem with that is you have access to reroll ones anyways and on better platforms. So this guy had a similar ability in 7th edition that was really cool, but I believe it was reroll all misses. So it kind of like painted you. It was like a pseudo marker light. Um, that made more sense. In this codex, we have all kinds of access to reroll ones. So what is this guy really doing for you? Is he good in close combat? No. Is his shooting impressive? Not really. Um, is he hard to kill? Quantum shielding. But that's all, that's all over the place. So take your Triarch Stalkers. Take your Triarch Pra Praetorians. And right now, just take anything that says Triarch. And I want you to just grind them up put them in a blender, grind it up, and snort it. Don't do that. That would be incredibly painful and dangerous. Don't actually do that. But do grind them up. But probably don't do that either. Satan Shard of the Deceiver. Here's where we get into some really good stuff. Once again, it's an hour 20 in, by the way, and we're not even close to being done. Jeff! Um, movement 8, weapon skill 2, blitz skill 2, strength 7, tough 7, wounds 8, attacks 4, leadership 10, save 4+. plus. He has Necrodermis. The stand shard of the receiver has a 4 plus and vulnerable save. Dread. Your opponent must add 1 to morale test for any enemy unit within 12 of the stand shard of the receiver. These rules are all over the damn codex. This, like, not codex, excuse me, but codexes. You know, add 1 to your morale. It's not what they think it is. It's not. GW, if you're listening, it's not impressive. Nobody cares. The guy that gives you the plus one on morale forgets about it half the time because it's so unimpressive. And the people receiving the plus one morale, uh, when they're told that this is what happens, the response unanimously is, oh, okay, I lose one more guy. Or they're like, yeah, yeah, I, I ignored it. It's fine. Every time. That's the two responses. There's nobody that goes, it does what? And the guy's like, that's right, you piece of shit. The Satan Shard of the Deceiver, plus one to your morale. It says it right here. It's called Dread. It's called Dread, you dumb, dumb man. Nobody does that. Conversations never happened. Um, I say we up this. If, if you want to make that rule scary and impressive anywhere in any of these codexes, it needs to be plus three to morale, plus five to morale. Talk about it doing something like nuking a unit when they lose too many guys or fo forcing your opponent to spin command points to auto-pass. Now we're talking about an ability that people are starting to, like, gear up for. Plus one? And right now, by the way, there could be there could be Kevin Lichtenstein of Games Workshop Deep Development standing next to me. He'd be like, but Jeff, if you fancy yourself a strategian... Imagine this ability in accompaniment with other abilities of minus one leadership. And now we're talking about minus two or three. <laughs> still unimpressive. And also stupid, and nobody's going to synergize that way. 
There's like the Harlequin Codex that tries to do it, I guess. Terranids, which are supposed to be like the most fearsome. We got access to one. And I think maybe if you tripped, fell, and accidentally filled in Death Leaper into your list, you could do that one as well. But I can't remember because it's Death Leaper and nobody plays with him. Anyways, that's my rant. He's actually a really cool unit. It's just that ability and that thing in particular is so stupid. Grand Illusion. At the beginning of the first battle round, but before the first turn begins, you can remove the Satan Shard of the Deceiver and or up to D3 friendly Necron units from the battlefield, then set them up again more than 12 inches from any enemy models. If you do so, these units cannot charge in your first turn. Pretty damn cool. So no, you can't charge with them. Um, I'm still thinking there's some cool ways to make that a scary, like I am going to charge you, but, I, but because I think they have access to enough other ways to do that, maybe that's not how you use this, but short range shooting in, um, certain detachments where they gain plus one rend when they're at half distance, warrior blocks that already are at minus one range 24, put them 12 inches away now they're rapid fire i think it's one so they're shooting twice at minus two rend one damage starting to think about this starting to think a little bit and it's not even like that's the only thing he does powers of the satan the satan shard of the deceiver knows the two powers of the satan it can use one of its powers at the end of each of its movement phases we'll show you those powers in a second if the Satan Shard of the Deceiver is ever reduced to zero wounds, roll a d6. Um, on a four plus, its skin tears and it blows up for d3 within three. <laughs> Enslaved Star God. This model can never have a Warlord trait. It's fine. I didn't want it to have one anyways. Uh, it's a character. It's a monster. So that those eight wounds, by the way, you can hide it. It has fly. Um, no infantry or anything like that, though. But 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 you know what I'm saying? The Satan Shard and up to D3. Did it say D3? Ah, I do have to roll for it. Okay, it is D3. I'm thinking 20 or 40 uh, warriors right in front of your face shooting. Well, 20 would shoot 40 times. 40 would shoot 80 times. And if you have the characters and, and you get them over there, hitting on twos, rerolling ones, wounding most things on fours or threes at minus two one damage 100 percent, this mulches any screen in the game um and with those numbers hitting on twos reeling ones you're looking at doing significant damage to a fire raptor if not killing it right 80 shots i think that absolutely does kill it pretty cool satan shard of the Nightbringer. eight inch movement weapon skill two blitz skill two strength seven tough seven wounds eight attacks four leadership ten save four plus so exactly the same Oh, sorry, I actually misspoke, um, or I didn't say this. The, 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 the Deceiver has the Star God Fists as its weapon. It's Strength User, which is 7, minus 4, 3 damage, with 4 attacks. Bitch, please, that's pretty good. Alright, um, down here, Gaze of Death, range 12, Assault D6, Strength asterisk mark ap minus four d3 damage this weapon wounds on a two plus unless it is targeting a vehicle in which case it wounds on a six plus all right it's like a super flamer sith of the nightbringer um strength is always wounds on a two plus unless it's targeting a vehicle in which case it has a strength value of seven minus four d6 damage what's that you're hitting mortarian okay you're hitting on twos, possibly. Uh, I don't think he gets reroll ones because he's not a infantry. Hitting on twos, wounding on twos, minus four d6 damage. He's only got four attacks. We're not talking about him dropping Mortarian, but he's doing. He's getting a couple of those in there. Could do like you know, nine, ten, eleven, twelve damage somewhere in there. He's got a four plus plus. He knows uh, two powers as well. He's also an enslaved god. He also explodes, so not quite as cool. I think the Deceiver for me is is uh, really amazing. This is the damage guy. Um, he's got that super flamer, which is kind of cute. But, you know, Assault D6, we've seen that, right? You roll that six, you're, you're frying six guys, which is amazing. 
um, or you know you're you're picking a single target like you are dropping on Mortarian and you're doing like five flame attacks all with D3 and then you're chopping with with your giant scythe. Okay, that's all pretty cool. Um, but it's the powers that give me the big selling point on him because otherwise I would just take the Satan shard of the Deceiver because there's he has damage he's got the powers the same defensive qualities um, but he's teleporting people freaking around the table. Kanaptic Wraith. So we'll come to the powers later, guys. Uh, move 12. Weapon skill 3. Blue skill 3. Strength 6. Tough 5. Wounds 3. Attacks 3. Leadership 10. Save 4+. plus. But they don't just have a 4+. plus. I'm going to go right down to the abilities. Wraith form. Models in this unit have a 3+. plus vulnerable save and can move across models and terrain as if they were not there. Models in this unit can shoot and charge if they fall back this turn. That is massive. They can fall back and still charge. Um, you might be weirded out by them saying they can shoot. They gave them the ability to take... So any model may take a particle caster, trans-dimensional beamer, or whip coils. Um, particle caster is range 12, pistol 1, strength 6, 1 damage. Trans-dimensional beamer is 12, heavy D3, strength 4, minus 3, 1 damage. Each time you roll a wound roll you roll a wound roll of six for this weapon the target suffers a mortal wound i don't know you can give them these things i think the points start to kind of stack up because i would just keep them at vicious claws which is strength user which is six minus two two damage um you can give them whip coils because if the bear is slain they basically get to swing if they die I wouldn't even give them whip coils, to be honest with you. It's the same profile as their Vicious Claw, so all you're paying for is if they die, they still get the swing. I wouldn't do it. A three-wound model at tough five with a three plus plus, and it can zip around going 12 inches moving through shit? No. Um, don't pay for the contingency plan of it dying and still swinging, because it's just going to be fine. Being able to tie something up and then fall back and still charge is incredible. It's very, very powerful. Very powerful. Your wife says get a job. I don't think so. But I would tell you what your wife was saying, but it's inappropriate. You know what I'm saying? No. That's not fair. You don't have a wife because you're a loser. Canaptic Scarabs. Uh, Canaptic Scarabs Swarm. So these are your, like little, these are fast attack, which is what um, rates are as well, by the way. Movement 10 inches, weapon skill 4 plus. Strength 3, tough 3, wounds 3, attacks 4, leadership 10, save 6 plus. This is your rippers. Um, they're hitting on 4s. You know, their, their cool thing is they have fly. They have swarm and fly. Um, so they're very mobile. And then if, a, if the target's toughness is higher than the attack strength, this weapon always uh, wounds the target on a 5 plus. So it used to be that you were reliably doing damage to like a knight. It used to just do, it was like pseudo haywire wounds basically. Um, which is kind of cool. But now it's just like, yeah, if they're tougher than your strength, which your strength is three, you're wounding on a five. Is that exciting? Not really. They're four attacks each and they move 10 and they have flies. So so like the, the weird area you could go into is you gang up on something and you're putting, you know, if you get like eight bases in there, that's um, it's a lot of attacks and they're wounding on fives, but that's not exciting. It's it's there's no AP there's there's no extra damage, no like mortal wounds on a six or something. So I don't know. And are they fast attack? They are too, right? Yeah. I don't, you're not gonna see scarabs. I don't think so. They needed to still have some rule against hurting vehicles um, more reliably or something like that. They don't have it, so I I, I think they go the way of the dodo. I, I don't think you take it. Tomb blades. Move 14, web skill 3, blue skill 3, strength 4, tough 5, wounds 2, attacks 1, leash of 10, save 4 plus. Um, I'm going to start speeding through some of this, which is predictably what I did last time, and I understand that upset some people, but um, otherwise we're going to be here too long. They're basically the same, okay? They have a couple different weapons, um, but you're still probably taking... They're all one damage weapons, and they just have just like different things, like on a 6 to get 3 hits instead of 1 on the Tesla Carbine. The Particle Beamer has a higher strength, Salt 3, and then the Goss Blaster is strength 5, minus 2, 1 damage. I don't think you take this. Um, they're minus 1 to be shot at, and they have a 3-plus uh, save, and they ignore cover, but ignoring cover is not what it used to be. They also have a 5-plus invul save, so it's all it's all okay. 
this is not the triarch stuff which i would would have told you to just never take ever and and you know they're terrible um but it used to be cool because in seventh edition you'd have a unit of these guys zipping around knocking things off objectives and they were you needed to ignore cover because necrons otherwise had no access to that so back in the day when you're fighting warcon and um stealth suits and stuff like that this was your best way to kind of get through that but that's not as big of a deal in this so now we get down to destroyers destroyers and heavy destroyers have the exact same profile of moving at 10 weapon skill 3 blitz skill 3 strength 4 and then necron stat line they have two attacks for some reason um the goss cannon is heavy 3 strength 6 minus 3 d3 damage that's really nice that's what they come stock with each destroyer is armed with the goss cannon yeah the heavy destroyer can be armed with a heavy goss cannon which is heavy 1 strength 9 minus 4 d6 damage you're seeing a lot of heavy but they have the rural repulsor uh, platform which means they ignore moving while heavy and you can reroll uh, hit rolls of one for this unit and they're all with skill and, and weapon skill three so they're very accurate uh, these guys are infantry so they get access to hitting on twos reeling ones and then they don't suffer the minus for moving so a really good weapons platform the problem with them in the index is that they were too expensive i believe their points were dropped down but was it dropped down enough i don't know i think you will see destroyers but they're not like they used to be where it was like the destroyers did the heavy lifting of your list i think you're going to start seeing more satans more command barges more uh tesseract vaults we'll get to that in a second heavy destroyers what why does this have a separate page it's literally listed right there what am i okay yeah covered it i don't know why it's just... it literally says destroyer and heavy destroyer and the next uh, segment is heavy destroyer it's like yeah it's like old uncle al you're, you're we heard you say that already canaptic spiders move six weapons go four plus go four strength six tough six wounds four attacks four leadership 10 save three plus i think this is a weird missed opportunity they have fly which is cool they're a monster but four wounds huh that's barely more than the uh the stock normal other things um Fabrica fabricator claw array uh you can repair a single vehicle so that's okay they have to be within one inch they repair d3 gloom prism a model equipped with a gloom prism can attempt to deny one psychic power in each enemy psychic phase in the manner as a psyker that's pretty sick i still i'm going to be honest with you guys i would have taken this and gone one of two ways I either would have made spiders dirt ass cheap, which they might be, but maybe not. Hang on. Well, I just straight up don't see him. Anyways, I would have made them dirt ass cheap so you can like spam them, or I would have made them deny two powers. Necrons have almost no other way to do that, so. Scarab Hive, at the beginning of your turns, you can roll a D6 for each Canoptic Scarab's unit from your army that is below its starting numbers of models and within six inches. So it replenishes them. Um, you cannot make new ones, basically. They, they kind of did away with that. It's got minus two D3 damage close combat at strength six, so that's okay. And it's gun at strength six, uh, AP nothing, one damage. So you would take it for the deny, but if it's not cheap, then I wouldn't. And um, only four wounds, tough six. It's dying a lot. The monolith. Movement is 20 inches at full health. Wait, no. No, no, it's movement six, excuse me. Both skill three. Portal of Exile goes four, and then at the middle tier is five. Lowest tier, it's six. So we'll we'll talk about that in a second. It is armed with four Gauss flux arcs and a particle whip. Particle whip is heavy six, strength eight, minus two, d three damage. So that's sick. Um, hitting off its bliss skill of three plus. It's it's got four Gauss flux arcs, which are heavy three, strength five, minus two, one damage. And now remember, in eighth edition, facing is not a thing, so it's shooting all four of those at you at all times. So it's heavy. Heavy 12, strength 5, minus 1, uh, or minus 2, 1 damage. 
and then the particle whip it's just it's got short range but that's okay too because i'll get to that in a second um death descending it can deep strike portal of exile when enemy unit other than a monster or vehicle finishes a charge move within one inch of this model its portal of exile may activate roll a d6 and compare it to the value required on the damage table above if the roll is successful the charging unit suffers d6 mortal wounds so on this big bad boy that's tough eight with eight with 20 wounds there's some lists like my custodies that really can only hurt this by charging it if i charge it with my bike unit and two shield captains and it's at full health on a four plus each one of those units takes d6 mortal wounds that is not a joke um, pretty sick. Obviously, if you have a unit of 30 of something that's looking to just maul this thing down, D6 Mortal on a 4+, plus, not a big deal. But those more important characters, the ones that you would want to get in there and do damage to it, a Dreadnought, perhaps. Uh, Dreadnought's a vehicle, I guess, huh? And you know what? I I don't like that either. I would have taken out the monster or vehicle thing. Why not? I would have at least made monster and vehicle like a 5+. plus. It's harder to do it, sure, but you can still do it. Because if there's a door that's to a d different dimension, it's sucking down my land speeder. Maybe it doesn't get the whole land speeder, but it probably hurts it. That would be my um, argument here. It explodes D6. It's uh, on a six explodes. Everything within six takes D6 mortal, so it explodes even harder. It's a floating fortress, so it moves and doesn't suffer the minus one for shooting its heavy weapons. It's all right. It's pretty cool. Uh, hovering, it's just qu like clarifies the distance on uh, moving with it it's pretty cool um it is a firing platform it's a big ass tank um i kind of wish they kept they the door used to be more interesting so it does damages it does damage let me read this to make sure oh no it's still oh no 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 it still does do this so it's the eternity gate when you set up this model at the same time you can also set up a number of friendly uh, dynasty infantry units of their tomb world rather than setting them up on the battlefield before this b model moves in your movement phase a single friendly dynasty unit that has set up on their tomb world can be transported onto the battlefield by the monolith um, so this is how you teleport some of those things in there is it say single unit let me see any number of friendly dynasty infantry units on their tomb world rather than setting them up on the battlefield before this model moves in your movement phase, a single friendly dynasty unit that has set up on their tomb world can be transported onto the battlefield by the monolith. Okay. So it, you could set up as many as you want in Deep Strike, but it can only deploy one at a time. I think, all right, that's fairish. Otherwise, every list would be a monolith with the you know three or four characters and then two units of whatever the hell it is and then surprise we're all here and it's a clown car um i understand why they don't necessarily want that annihilation barge movement 12 weapon skill six bliss skill three because it's a close combat guy <laughs> strength five tough six eight wounds three attacks leisure 10 save four plus but it has quantum shielding it's got living metal it explodes um Oh no, it's it's the it's not the excuse me, it's the shooting one. You can get the twin Tesla Destructor, which is assault eight, strength seven minus one, but every uh, six is three instead of one, so it's like DACA. The Gauss Cannon, heavy three, strength six minus three d uh, three damage, or the Tesla Cannon, assault three, strength six minus one, uh, not minus one, excuse me, one damage. Each hit roll of six is three hits instead of one. It's okay. Um, I don't know. I think I think you're looking at some cool stuff with uh, the dynasty that that adds a rend to uh, attacks. S Assault eight, strength seven, but every six is three instead of one. At minus one, is a pretty sick assault cannon of sorts. Otherwise, I'm not overly impressed with this. Doomsday arc. Um, movement is twelve inches. Blitz skill three, attacks three. Its attack is one of the things that degrades. Who cares? Um, otherwise it's 14 wounds at tough only six though mm. but I feel like I feel like they they're pretty smart about that if something is quantum shielding it's ten, it tends to not be very tough but it doesn't take any damage for high damage stuff so you can DACA down Necron vehicles for the most part 
Imagine if the monolith had had a quantum shielding. It doesn't. Um, this just has access to the Doomsday Cannon, basically. Low power, it's range 36, heavy D6, strength 8 minus 2, D3 damage, which is the strongest gun in the Terranid Codex, a.k.a. kind of a kind of a poopy. Um, but, you know, it's, it's okay. Heavy D6 is cute. High power is range 72, heavy D6, strength 10, minus 5, D6 damage. A model can only fire the Doomsday Cannon at high power if it remains stationary in its preceding movement phase. This is what you're going to be shooting. That's some serious anti-tank. Range 72 on a vehicle that has fly um, hitting on threes. So that's pretty gnarly. Uh, you can give it the Goss Flare Array, which is rapid fire 5, strength 4, minus 1. Um, this is your like anti-tank thing. Uh, okay, I could see people taking it. Again, it's not necessarily something that you write your whole list around. And I don't know that it balances out a list, because I see a lot of Necron lists wanting to um, either be like pretty all in on character support charges or super monsters, Satan shards and Tesseract volts and stuff like that. Um, where does this fit in? You know, is one doomsday arc in the back peppering out shots on stuff that scary? Kind of D six shots. If you, uh, if you're rolling hot, you know, it's pretty cool. It's okay. It's really okay. I give it a solid like B minus, which, you know, in um, some house in my household, that's like a Jeff pick the dinner kind of day. But in some of my friends' house, that's the kids out on the street looking for a new home. Um, Transcendent Satan is a eight inch moving web skill two plus skill two Satan numbers. Uh, crackling tendrils, which is strength user minus four d six damage. And this is the uh, powers. It has powers of Satan. It knows two powers, just like the other two know two powers. Reality unravels, it explodes. Enslaved Star God can't have a warrior trait. Fractured personality. Before the battle, you can pick one of the abilities opposite to apply to this model for the duration of the battle. Alternatively, you can roll 2d6 to randomly determine two abilities and apply them both to the model. Very cool. Again, that's like a a fun like reward the RNG um, or you know pick specifically. So let's go down the, the thing. Number one, Cosmic Tyrant. This model can use two different powers of the Satan at the end of each of your movement phase instead of only one. Immune to natural law, add one to saving throws made for this model. So he goes down to a three up with an invul of a three up, I think, right? Yes. So his Necrodermis would become a three up invul. Um, number three, this model regains D3 loss wounds at the start of each of your turns. Number four, transdimensional displacement. When this model advances, add 12 inches to the move character for that movement phase instead of rolling a dice. Entropic Touch, number five. You can reroll failed wound rolls for this model in the fight phase. Six, Writhing Worldscape. Enemy units do not receive a bonus to their saving throws for being in cover. Um, whilst they're within 12. Very powerful stuff. So for me, the two powers instead of one is massive for your damage output. Um, and add one to saving throws. Would you roll 2d6 and go with that? Hmm. It's hard to say. Um, Reroll failed wounds in the fight phase is cool. Not great. Writhing Worldscape is a giant stinker. Ignoring cover is not what they think it is in this edition either. Uh, advancing 12 inches, but with it not saying something like they can advance and then forget about it. Um, I don't know. I think there's like... I think there's a dynasty that lets you do that or maybe a stratagem. So all of a sudden that synergy starts to make sense if that is the case. Because then we're talking about something that's going 20 inches and then still getting to act. I think I would almost always personally pick the add one to saving throws. Or I would pick the Cosmic Tyrant and have it do two powers. Um, it has fly. <clears throat> and it's a character. So eight wounds. These guys are going to be a problem, guys. Transcendent Satans, Deceivers, uh, and, and the, the Reaper one are going to be problems. These are very powerful things that I'm talking about right here. Um, and we'll talk about their points in a second too because they don't even like m define your list. Ghost Arc, very similar to what it used to be. Still tough six, still 14 wounds. Quantum Shielding explodes. Repair Barge adds Warriors. Cool. Uh, the Doom Scythe 
is the Flying Crusant, except that it has the Death Ray, which is heavy D3, strength 10, minus 4 D6 damage. These guys are going 20 to 60 inches. Um, they're airborne, so they can only attack or be attacked by things with a fly roll. Hard to hit, minus 1 to hit on them, cool. Supersonic, if this model uh, moves, first pivot it on the spot up to 90 degrees, and then move it. It can't go into hover mode, so you got to kind of keep that in mind. Strength 10, yeah. Heavy D3. Um, it does not ignore, by the way. So the heavy D3 is unfortunate because it is supposed to go 3, so when it moves, it's shooting and hitting on a 4. Yeah, I'm not missing anything there. Night Scythe. Um, it's got the Tesla Destructor, which is like the DACA. It's airborne. Hard to hit, supersonic, invasion beams. When you set this model up at the same time, you can also... So this thing uh, deep strikes dudes, but it's at the beginning of the movement phase, so remember you have to deep strike. The guys drop out of it, then it can move. So that's cool. Otherwise, you would fly it up there, drop off guys, and then turn one assault everything forever. Um, but it's got the, the hard to hit. It's uh, got 12 wounds, only tough six. And it shoots out the DACA. It's the strength seven, four shots, and every six is three hits. But that's just not what it used to be. It's just not. But it's okay. The Obelisk. Um, hovering Sentinel. So it can deep strike. Gravity pulse at the start of your shooting phase. Roll a D6 for each enemy unit that can fly, that, that can fly and is within the distance specified on the damage table uh, above. On a roll of six, that unit suffers D3 mortal wounds. So when it's at full health, uh, full health, excuse me, the the gravity pulse is 18 inches. So if you guys remember, this was a thing that happened in seventh edition. People are starting to take obelisks because it's kind of cute. You deep struck them in, and they like just shot the crap out of everything that had fly. Um, now it's like a it's like a pulsating AOE. Um, and it just has the Tesla sphere, which is just five shots. I don't know. I'm not feeling this thing. 24 wounds. Uh, on a 6 explodes. Where is the damage, though? Oh, it's just D3 mortal wounds. I don't know. I don't... I'm not... I don't know. Tesseract Volt has living metal. It knows the powers of the Satan. It can use a number of different powers. Uh... Oh, it knows it knows four powers. That's pretty cool. Trans temporal force field. This model has a four plus invulnerable save. Vengeance of the Enchained. If this model reduces zero wounds, it explodes. Does more mortals. Uh, movement eight inches. Blitz skill three, and it it actually degrades from powers of Satan. So it, it does three, then two, then one. But it's weapon skill six plus, which is too bad. Blitz skill three plus. Strength 8, tough 7, wounds 28, attacks 3, leadership 10, save 3 plus. On something with a 4 plus invul save. That is pretty darn nasty. Um, its obvious thing is that it knows all these powers. That's the thing, the Tesseract Vault. Um, So it, the powers of the Satan rule, let me not gloss over this like I initially did. So it knows four powers, but it can use up to three powers when it's at full strength. Nothing else does that. The other guys do two. This guy does three powers um, and knows four of them. So you can you know most of the chart, and then you get to cast three of them. Its toughness is seven. So that is pretty damn nasty so now we're over here um we're starting to look at the different stat lines for these things i think we covered most of that i want to look at the prices we'll get to that in a second i guess okay so this page kind of talks about how some of the named characters are actually specified to certain uh dynasties i believe so you do have to kind of keep your eye on that or they work better in those dynasties and then the stratagems. Um, I was pretty darn impressed with the stratagems. They're pretty darn useful. Two command points, enhance reanimation protocols. Uh, Reroll roll, rolls a one. 
Wrath of the Satan. Use the stratagem after a Satan shard from your army has resolved the power of the Satan. Roll a d6 to randomly select a power of the Satan from page 113. The Satan shard immediately uses the power rolled, even if it has already been used. That's two command points. You're going to be doing that. <clears throat> Does it have shielding? No, it did not. Emergency evasion beam. Um, that's deep strike. Use the stratagem when the last dynasty knight scythe uh, and or monolith from the army is destroyed. Before removing the model from the battlefield, you can immediately set up a friendly dynasty unit still on their tomb world wholly within three. So that's nice because what this is saying is if they're in deep strike and you lose your, your vehicles that allow them to kind of enter into the, the battle, this is one command point to not lose those guys. Otherwise, they're dead because that's a unique Necron rule. Everybody else doesn't have that. They just deep strike normally or something. Uh, amalgamated targeting data, one command point. Use this stratagem in your shooting phase. If a dynasty doom scythe from your army is within six of two other friendly dynasty doom scythes, the doom scythe cannot fire their death rays this phase. Instead, select a point on the battlefield within 24 inches of all three vehicles that is visible to them. Roll a d6 for each unit within three inches of that point. Add one to the result of the unit being rolled for. If it has five or more models, but subtract one if the unit being rolled for as a character on a four plus the unit suffers three D three mortal wounds. So that was a lot of reading. I feel like I just went through eighth grade English class, but uh, get my leg under the table, but 24 inches draw a line on a four plus three D three mortal wounds. So the doom, the doom guns that we were talking about, that was at strength 10 minus four, I think D six damage, which is really nice. Um, but it's susceptible to things like saves or, you know, you miss. Uh, this is just hit a point, and on a 4+, plus, it's 3d3 moral to everything within 3. Um, characters are on a 5. Oh, and it's add 1, by the way, if they have more than 5 models. So if somebody bunches up a bunch of uh, troops or something like that, you can drop a bunch of bodies on them. Dynastic heirlooms, it's 1 or 3 command points. That's to get the relics. Uh, one extra or two extra respectively enhanced invasion beam use the stratagem before you set up a unit from a tomb world using the invasion beams ability of a knight scythe from your army or the eternity gate ability of a monolith from your army you can set up two units from a tomb world instead of one so that's just one command point and that's pretty cool because um, remember we were talking about they, they very much so said set up as much as you want in deep strike but each of these transports only drops off one unit at a time so that's a huge liability but for one command point you are dropping off those 20 flayed ones and you are dropping off emotech or something like that one command point solar pulse use this stratagem after a necrons unit from your army has declared its targets in the shooting phase but before any hit rolls are made pick one of the enemy units that your target is your unit is targeting the enemy unit does not receive the benefit of cover ah it's one command point it's nice uh this codex feels like feels like an angry necron player wrote it from seventh edition because they did not have any ignore cover and that was like one of the worst things for them i can tell you that as a warcon player every time i explained to them i had a two up save they were just like all right resurrection protocols one command point this stratagem when uh uses when a necron character from your army excluding tracing the infinite and satan shards is slain at the end of that phase roll a d6 on a four plus set the character up again as close as possible to his previous position and more than one inch from the enemy um, with one wound remaining, the stratagem cannot be used to resurrect the same model more than once per battle. One command point for any character that's not a shard and is not Trazine the Infinite. Hello! Hello! And a lot of those characters are healing D3 wounds. Not bad. If that was like two or three command points, I think this would be a little bit of a stinker, but at one command point... These Necron some bitches just won't die. Damage control override. One command point. Use this stratagem at the start of your turn. Pick a Necron's vehicle from your army. Until the end of this turn, use the top row. Okay. Two command points. Repair sub or uh, subroutines. Uh, select the Canoptic unit from your army that is on the battlefield. That unit gains the reanimation protocol's ability until the end of your turn. Cool. Okay. Um, self destruction. Use the strat. It's one command point. Use the stratagem uh, uh, after a unit of canoptic scarabs from your army piles in, but before they make their close combat attack, select the can canoptic scarab swarm model in your unit, and then pick an enemy unit within one inches of it. 
Your Canoctus Scarab Swarm model is destroyed. Remove it from the battlefield and roll a d6 on a 2 plus unit you pick suffers d3 mortal wounds. It's one command point is why that's okay. But you're not building this around it. You know what I would add it to this? I would have said um, something along the lines of this stratagem can be used multiple times per phase. And I know that, and then that jumps it up to really powerful. But the reason why I feel like that's okay is because they're taking an otherwise stinky unit in the uh, Canoptic Scarab's swarms and they're spending command points to make them really strong. And it still is just D3 mortal. And someone could be like, but Jeff, what if they, what if they get six bases around something? Then they're spending six command points. And I feel like uh, with Scarabs in particular, there's almost no way for that to, to just like jump on someone and have them have no interaction. Um, you can get two bases out of a monolith if you use a command point, another stratagem to drop out to. I don't know. Their units are three. I don't know. Something. Something there is what I'm saying. I don't want to get too... I'm just spitballing, so someone's going to be like, that's way too powerful. Maybe it is. But something more is what I'm saying. Make it say it can be used twice per phase. One command point, disruption fields. Use the stratagem before a Necron infantry unit from your army fights in the fight phase. Increase the strength characteristic of those models in that unit by one until the end of the phase. But wait, guys. What, what if you already gave them plus one strength? Now they're strength six warriors. Am I... Is anyone seeing this? Is it Codex warriors running around? With their one attack, just punching Space Marines in the face until they die? It probably is. Entropic Strike. One command point. Use a stratagem in the fight phase before Necron's character from your army fights. Invulnerable saves cannot be taken against the first close combat attack made by this character this phase. The wording of this is going to keep me up at night. Invulnerable saves cannot be taken against the first close combat attack made by this character. It says invulnerable saves with an S, multiple, cannot be taken against the first close combat attack made by this character this phase. Are they trying to say of his four attacks, the one swipe from the war scythe, you don't get invulnerable save? Or are they trying to say the first time they fight, all four of his attacks ignore your invulnerable save? What is it? Why do we talk this way? I would say, I would basically word it this way for this. I would say the first attack, and then they've done this before. I'd put in parentheses one of four attacks ignores interval save or i would say all attacks made in their first you know first engagement ignore invulnerable saves what the hell two command points dispersion field amplification use the stratagem in the shooting phase when an enemy unit targets a unit of lich guard from your army equipped with dispersion fields your unit's invulnerable save is improved to three plus until the end of the phase in addition, until the end of the phase, each time you roll an unmodified six for that unit's invulnerable save, the unit that made that attack suffers a mortal wound after it's finished making all of its shooting attacks. That's what I was talking about. They had a three plus plus, which seemed to be more useful to me. Is this stratagem enough for you to start taking Lich Guard? I don't know. Maybe. Quantum deflection, one command point. Use the stratagem when an enemy unit targets a vehicle in your army that has the quantum shielding ability, but before any hit rolls are made, until the end of the phase, subtract one from rolls made for your vehicle's quantum shielding ability to see if the damage is ignored for each unsaved wound. So for one command point, you actually do ignore um, any six damage flat. Pretty funny. Um, it just makes quantum defl quantum shielding that much more annoying extermination protocols but i do like that it specifies when you do this by the way it doesn't wait for you to roll the six on that melta it says no i'm going to use it now and then when they do roll the six you get to be like that's right mother trucker but when they actually roll a two and you're like 
I still don't mind it because I was playing safe. Extermination protocols, one command point. Use the stratagem in your shooting phase. Before shooting with a destroyer lord, a unit of destroyers or a unit of heavy destroyers from your army, reroll failed hit and win rules for that unit until the end of the phase. One command point to give them what they had in the other Decurion in 7th edition. I'm okay with that. Um, in fact, you heard me saying earlier that this is the kind of thing that I wish there was more of. Destroy Lords rerolling all hits and all wounds for one command point. Excuse me. Um, is that very powerful? Yes. But it is coming at some of a cost, right? You're still paying a command point. Um, we're seeing these kind of rules in other codexes where they just get it for free. And that was stupid. That was too powerful. I like that there is an interaction here. Um, now you are looking at destroyers and you are looking at the stratagem and saying, I can do both of these things and I like it. The Farron's Will. Use the stratagem after an overlord from your army has used their My Will Be Done, My Will Be Done, or Wave of Command ability. That model can immediately use that ability for a second time this turn. It does specify that no unit can be the target of that twice in the same turn, so don't start thinking to yourself this gets around it. It doesn't. This is just a nice way to double down on that if you have two units that you want to be giving these buffs to. Adaptive subroutines, one command point. By the way, a lot of these are one command point. They're dirt cheap. Use the stratagem after a canoptic unit from your army has advanced. That unit can still shoot and or charge this turn. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of things that have that canoptic keyword. Uh, that is that character that's moving 20 inches. The problem is he's not really a damage dealer, so who cares? Um, but there you go. Dimensional corridor. Use the stratagem as one command point. Use this stratagem at the start of your movement phase. Select the dynasty infantry unit from your army that is more than one inches from any enemy models and remove it from the battlefield. Then set it up, uh, set the unit up again so that it is wholly within three inches of a, dy a dynasty monolith from your army and more than one from any mo enemy models. That, uh, that unit counts as having disembarked from the monolith this turn. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. So you can't be in combat. But you get the teleport stuff to your monolith. So there's some there's some cheeky stuff you can do there. Uh, it's just movement manipulation. It's only one command point. So I don't necessarily think you should write your list around this. That's that same kind of thing again. Railsy Dice, thank you very much. You sexy son of a bitch. Um, but it's one of those things where in the middle of a game, your opponent certainly is not going to know you can do this. And then you're going to do it. It's going to catch them completely off guard. And you're going to start hovering cross-legged with your you know cape flailing behind you. Gravitic Singularity. I like how we're pushing two hours. Actually, we're over two hours again. I can't stop talking about Warhammer, guys. Use the stratagem at the start of your shooting phase. Select an obelisk from your army. When resolving this model's gravity pulse ability this phase, each enemy unit within range that can fly suffers D3 mortal wounds on a roll of a 4 plus instead of a roll of a 6. So, this is going to hurt me because it's funny because I, I look at this through the lens of my custody biker guys. That's pretty much the only thing this bones. Like, <laughs> doing that kind of stuff to other stuff just doesn't really matter, but that's awesome. I guess. But I, you shouldn't be, there shouldn't be any obelisk out there. I don't know. This is a little bit weird. Cosmic powers, one command point. This stratagem at the start of your movement phase, select the Satan shard from your army. That model can replace one of its powers of Satan with a different power of the Satan of your choice. So, you know what you do? You roll the 2d6, like it said. You take those two. If you don't like what you got, you spend one command point, replace the one you didn't like with one you do like. This is just doubling down and making it more reliable that you can um, grab that. It's pretty sick. I have to take a second here to say thank you, Gary Salami, by the way. Tier 3 sub. You're amazing. Methodical destruction, two command points. Use the stratagem after a uh, saw tech unit from your army has inflicted an unsaved wound on an enemy model. Add one to hit rolls for friendly saw tech units that target the same enemy uh, that phase. It's okay. Um, a lot of this army, like I said, is infantry and that are already hitting on twos. Um, this is just another way to get there. So this whole codex has redundancies about adding plus one to weapon skill or bliss skill. Um, you're seeing a lot of this codex like starting at a bliss skill or weapon skill three plus and getting to a two plus pretty reliably. Um, reclaim a lost empire. Use the stratagem at the end of your turn. Select an, uh, 
Nilak unit from your army if the unit is within three inches of an objective marker or if it did not move for any reason during its turn then until the start of your next turn you can add one to saving throws made for that unit and increase the attacks characteristic of the model in the unit by one a lot of codexes have something similar to this it's just basically if you're around an objective you can get stronger okay uh, it's two command points translocation crypt uh, one command point use the stratagem during deployment you can set up a nephric army uh, nephric's infantry or swarm unit from your army in a translocation crypt instead of placing it in the battlefield at the end of any of your movement phases this unit can tran um, translocate into battle it's deep strike blood rights use the stratagem at the end of your fr uh, fight phase select a novak unit from your army that unit can immediately fight again for three command points a classic talent for annihilation this is a mephrit stratagem Use a strategy before a Mephrit unit from your army attacks in the shooting phase. Each time you make an unmodified hit roll of a 6 for a, a model in that unit, you can make one additional hit for that model with the same weapon against the same target. These additional hits cannot generate further. It's one command point. It's not bad. Here's the powers of the Satan. Anti-matter meteor. Roll a d6. On a 2+, plus, the closest visible enemy unit within 24 inches of the Satan shard suffers d3 mortal wounds. On a 6, it suffers D6 mortal wounds. Instead of the Satan Shard using this power is a Tesseract Vault. The unit suffers D6 mortal wounds on the roll of a 5+. plus. Just the closest. It's just Smite. It's just basically Smite. It's like a, a better Smite, though, because on a, on a single 6, you're doing D6. Times Arrow. Pick a visible enemy unit within... 18 inches of the Satan Shard and roll a d6, adding 1 to the result if the Satan Shard using the power is a Tesseract Volt. If the result exceeds the highest wounds char characteristic in the unit, one model from that unit chosen by the controlling player is slain. An unmodified roll of 1 will always fail. Kind of a cool way to pick out some guys. Sky of Falling Stars. Pick up to three different enemy units that are within 18 inches of the Satan Shard. Roll a d6 for each unit, subtracting one from the result if the Satan Shard using this power is a Tesseract Vault. If the result is less than the number of models in that unit, the unit suffers d3 mortal wounds. An unmodified roll of a 6 will always fail. Everybody within 18. Pick up to three within 18. Again really good against custodies i don't like saying that but it's true cosmic fire roll a d6 for each enemy unit within nine of the satan shard add one to the roll if the satan shard using this power is a tesseract vault on a four plus that unit being rolled for suffers d3 mortal wounds now remember the tesseract vault can do three of these so like three or four of these are the closest guys take d3 mortal or more holy cow seismic assault pick a visible enemy unit within 24 inches of the satan shard and roll a d6 for each model in that unit add one to the roll of the satan shard using this power is a tesseract vault for each result of a six plus that unit suffers a mortal wound that one's not as good i mean on a five plus it's pretty good but Transdimensional Thunderbolt. Pick, an, pick a visible enemy unit within 24 inches of the Satan Shard and roll a d6. You can only pick a character that has 10 or more wounds and or if it is closest enemy model to the Satan Shard. Add 1 to the result if the Satan Shard is using a vault. On a 4+, plus, the chosen unit suffers d3 mortal wounds. Then roll a d6 for every other enemy unit that is within 3 of the chosen enemy unit. On a 4+, plus, that unit being uh, rolled for suffers a mortal wound. pretty insane guys that's uh that's a lot like that's a lot of d3 some d6 a lot of insta just taking mortal wounds um and remember they use three and then they can actually just go ahead and do another one as well yikes yowzers um i think i'm not going to go through all the relics There's one that increases the toughness and wounds of the bearer by one if they're infantry. Um, 
There's one about coming back to life. Nilak model. Once per battle, you can reroll a single hit roll, wound roll, or damage roll for the bear. And he gets feel no pain. It's pretty cool. But I don't know who the Nilak characters are. You can put on like a destroyer lord. That's pretty sick. Uh, the blood scythe. Each time the bear fights, you can make a D3 additional attacks with this weapon. It's instead of a war scythe. So a lot of those guys have like four or five swings with that. You can get up to like eight or nine. Well, not nine probably, but uh, seven or eight. That's a lot. That is a lot. Um, there's the Veil of Darkness still. It's a teleportation thing. You have to be nine away, though. And everybody has to be within six. So it doesn't get around that. That's okay, though. Um, Nightmare Shroud. The bear's safety characteristic is improved by one. So... Uh, a lot of these, some of those guys are getting to a three plus plus. In addition, enemy units subtract one from their leadership characteristic whilst they're within six of the bear of the nightmare shroud. So there it is, guys. That's what I was talking about. We're talking minus two now. All right, you got dread from that satan shard, and you got this, you got this freaking nightmare shroud on, and we're starting to cook with fire. Uh, the warlord traits. These are the generic ones, and then I will read. The ones that go to this specific um, dynasties. Uh, reduce any damage inflicted on your warlord by one to a minimum of one. Okay. You can reroll failed wound rolls for your warlord in the fight phase if he charged, was charged, or performed a heroic intervention this turn. Okay. Uh, friendly dynasty units automatically pass morale unit uh, tests while they're within six of your warlord. In addition, your warlord can attempt to deny one psychic power in each enemy psychic phase in the same manner as a psyker. Um, I like that that's not just deny because that by itself is kind of boring. But keep in mind you can change your warlord and warlord traits um, in 8th edition. So if you are facing that Zinch army, all of a sudden you are pretty quick to, to go to this warlord trait, which is otherwise not super exciting. But denying one or two smites, uh, you know, it's a big deal. Uh, increase the range of all your Warlord's data sheet by three. Uh, abilities on data sheet. Eh. You can reroll failed charge rolls for friendly dynasty units within um, that are within six of your Warlord. That's kind of funny. It's just like they have all these these things and traits aimed towards making your guys like better in close combat. And I'm like, who are you? Who are you talking to? Necrons are good in close combat, by the way. They're not like... It's just weird because it's a, a lot of this is leaning towards get them into close combat, which is not necessarily where Necrons want to be. Um, it's just that they can handle themselves in close combat. It's the way I've kind of always just thought about it. Oh, save characters so it doesn't affect invuln. I think you're right. I, I misread that. You're right. Um, the, the precedent is when it says all of your save uh, characters, characteristics. That word today has been really hard for me. Um, if your warlord targets the same enemy character with all their close combat attacks add d3 to your warlord's attacks char uh, characteristic until the end of the phase alright so none of those are super good honestly the only one I, I think you would even consider taking is the immortal pride that's the um, deny ability um, reduce damage by one's kind of cute but I just don't think it is where you would go Sawtech, once per battle, you can reroll a single hit roll, wound roll, or damage roll made for your warlord. In addition, if your army is Battleforge and your warlord is on the battlefield, roll a d6 each time you spend a command point to use a stratagem on a 5 plus, the command point is immediately refunded. There it is. That's your grand strategist. So Sawtech is like the big the big dynasty. I think you, you take that. Um, Mephrit adds 6 to the maximum range of all assault weapons fired by your warlord. In addition, your warlord can shoot assault weapons at enemy characters even if they are not the closest enemy model nah the shooting of the single warlord getting getting a sniper and being impressive not that big of a deal nilak your warlord always fights first in the fight phase even if he uh didn't charge if your opponent has units that have charge or that have a similar ability then alternate choosing units to fight with starting with the player whose turn is taking place They have this wording in a lot of things, and I really don't like it. I think it's really weird. 
Um, there's a there's a bunch of abilities and codexes that are like you fight first unless you are charged. Well, that would be the time that you would want to fight first. It specifies that. It says unless they have that same ability, or they have units that have charged, in which case you alternate with the player. Like, I think that's really weird, and it's it's just not very impressive. Nefric, your opponent must subtract one from hit rolls that target your warlord. That's a classic. It's okay. Um, each time you roll an unmodified hit roll of a six, this is Novak, in the fight phase for a model in a friendly Novak unit that is within six of your warlord, you can make one additional hit roll for that unit. I think you take Sawtech. Why would you know? You take Sawtech, like pretty clearly. Uh, I'm just going to go through the points pretty quick on some of the things that we were talking about so like the named characters i'm going to read all of these because i think this is really interesting and rakir the traveler 167 satan shard of the deceiver 225 that ain't bad go buy all the satans satan shard of the nightbringer 210 so he's actually less expensive which is fair uh the deceiver is the one of the cooler abilities like i said and is the one you would take but the, the Nightbringer is still pretty damn sick, especially since they're both casting two of those powers, by the way, guys. Or one power. They know two of them and cast one. I don't know. But either way, they're just pumping out mortal wounds right and left. Uh, Illuminar Zerus, 143. Imotech the Stormlord, 200. Namaster Zandrek, 180. Oric and the Diviner, 115. Trazing the Infinite, 100. Vargard Oberon, 140. Very fairly priced. I think Namaster might be the only one that I'm looking at that, that I think that's too much. Um, the cancel out aura ability unless somebody really wants to get excited about it I just don't think it's that big of a deal um, and then he does the same kind of stuff that everybody else does but just at a 180 price not super impressive um, destroy lord start at 110 lords 73 overlord 84 cryptex are 70 catacomb command barge 138 these all do not include the gear so you have to pay more on top of that Death marks are 19 points a guy. Let me see if their gun costs anything. Okay, so they're just 19. The synaptic dis dis uh, wow synaptic disintegrator does not cost anything. So they're 19 points a model. So like I said, you buy 10 of them, it's 190 points, and they have to be more than nine away, but within 12 of what you're using their ability for. Otherwise, they're a 24-inch sniper unit hitting on threes. That's such absolute hot garbage. Tell me if I'm wrong. Some, you know, YouTube, you guys in chat, whatever. Someone shout me off this ledge, but I think that's terrible. Immortals are eight points, but they have... What is it called? The Heavy Goss Flare? I can't remember. It's not bad, though. Um... Necron Warriors, 12 points. And the Goss Flare does not cost anything. So they're 12 points. They're a little bit, little bit steep. But you have to remember they're tough four and they reanimate. So that's the GW is very consistent about pricing that out. Flayed ones cost 17 points. And they have Flare Claws, which do cost zero points as well. So they're 17 points a model. That's pretty expensive. But um, I think... This is your gene stealer, only even better in my in my opinion. Doesn't have the rend, but the shred is a big deal. The hitting on twos, reeling ones, all a big deal. <clears throat> so pretty reliably doing a lot. Um. Yeah, the triarch, the the triarch stinker fist, the triarch stalker, one hundred seventeen points before you add, what was it called, the heat ray or something like that, which is fifty four points. Was that on that guy? It was, wasn't it? Oh my god. No! Triarch Praetorians, 22 points a model. No! Canoptic Scarabs, 13 points a model. With that stratagem, uh, maybe they're like your backfield mucloid spore type thing. Canoptic Wraiths, 55 points a model. Um, that's fair though. But I think these guns cost points. Yeah, what do they take? It's like the particle beamer, maybe something like that. Particle whip is zero, but they don't take the particle whip. Do their claws cost anything? No, it does not. 
55 points is a lot, but that's a three plus plus three wound tough. What was it? Five uh, strength, six minus two, two damage guy. You're going to pay it. You're going to pay it. Particle caster. Is that what it's called? Uh, that costs four points. Yeah. I mean, maybe you add some shooting to it. It's just four points. That's a little bit pricey, and I know people are going to look at that and scoff, but I think yeah, it's worth it, man. Destroyers are 30 points before weapons, of course, and Tomb Blades are 14, but like I said, Tomb Blades, I don't know. I don't think you use those. Um, this is funny. So some of the other common things you'll see, like Heavy Destroyers, they, only, they start at 30 points as well, but then their gun, the Heavy Goss Cannon is 27 points. So they become 57 points per model. Still a lot less than what they used to be. The monolith is 381 points. Um, and I think you don't have to pay. Anyways, starts off pretty damn pricey. 381 points for that. You know where you're gonna spend those points? I'll tell you, I'll tell you right now. Tesseract Vault, it's a Lord of War. It is 496 points. Holy shit. Um, I still think it's good. And I still think you absolutely take one. I don't know about absolutely. I don't know that I say that. But it's still good enough to play. But that is expensive. 28 wounds, tough eight. Um, you know, it's pretty defensible. But that is one fourth of your entire army. That is a lot. The obelisk is 426 points of lol. You'll never see one. You're never going to see one of those in a million years. Um, yeah. And that's it. And guys, I know I heard it happen again towards the end there. I mega petered out. We're hitting two hours and 24 minutes. I've been dropping frames the entire time. I haven't been seeing complaining from you guys, so I guess it hasn't manifested in too terrible of a way. So I do appreciate that. Or maybe it is, and you guys are just all being angelic human beings. Hopefully, it's not too bad because I'd like this to be a great YouTube video. Um, but overall, my impression on the Codex is, again, one of kind of how I started off by saying this. Uh, I'll check on one thing. So, yeah, we'll take some questions, but let me just finish my thought. Um, I like this Codex a lot. I think if the Tau one was upsetting to Tau players, I really don't see Necron players being upset with this. Uh, so, yeah, feel free to ask some questions now. Are Death Marks and Lich Guard troops now? Yes, they are. Death Marks and Lich Guard are both troops at 19 points per model. Don't. Take your Immortals, take your Necron Warriors, and be happy with that. Yeah, okay, Kingdom Sword. Yeah, we'll work it out. Um... It has something to do with settings for why we're having drop frames over here. Anna streamed the other day from here and it was totally perfectly fine. So we'll figure it out, but um, I appreciate you guys being really understanding and uh, patient. It was only in the face cam for the most part. That's good to know. So the audio is fine. Okay. So yeah, if you guys have any questions, let's do that. Fire it away in the chat. I'd love to answer some um, while I'm waiting for you guys to ask. The data slate for death marks is elite. Well, they're true here, buddy. I'm looking right at it. So they're, they're troops there. That is better. It, it's definitely better than the troops. So they can help you out in, you know, some battalion tax or something like that. But I'm, I'm really disgusted with that, uh, more than nine away, but, but, um, you know, within 12, I think that's an, an incredibly unnecessary, um, nerf to something that's not that powerful anyways and would have been really cool because they're 19 points per model it's not even like they're, they're they're 10 points and you're getting them dirt cheap 
and you're not paying 19 points for a 24 inch sniper that that you're just deploying normally are you a fan of any of the name characters yeah i like ammo tech a lot i think you take both the satans deceiver and uh uh deathbringer or whatever probably a tesseract vault Farron, I, I'm telling you right now, man. I'll, I'll, I'll double check it for you. But I, I said at the beginning of the stream, too, that people, the the leaked codex or whatever, had a few things wrong with it. It says troops right here. I cannot misread this. And then it says death marks and lich guard. It's right here in this block right here where it says troops. I am willing to bet on the life of Barrison right now. That's not true. Below that, it says elites. And for elites, it's flayed ones, triarch praetorians, and triarch stalker. Obsec death marks? L listen, man. If that's what gets you going right now, you do it. Look up the battlefield roll. You mean you think in the book they're listed as something else? Nope. They're right here in the troop section. Or no, they're not. Oh, that's funny. No, they're not. Correct Amondo. You found it. Necron warriors and immortals have the triangle, which is troop. And death marks. Well, then what do you believe? What do you believe, guys? Honestly, I think it's kind of weird that they would only have warriors and they would only have um, immortals as infantry. They clearly satisfy both slots. <laughs> no, I, I I told you guys, I'm not swearing a bear's life. Either either way, you're you're gonna enter into my uh, debate world where I say no, no, no. It says troops and it has them listed right here. We don't know which one's the error. We don't know, so I would. I would be very, very comfortable in saying that Barrison gets to live on. Any other questions? Otherwise, we're going to shut it down. So, guys, um, just to kind of make my final announcements here, uh, shortly after this is turned off, Cobra's going to make it into a YouTube video. And we'll have that up on YouTube. So if you're not a sub and you didn't watch this entire thing because you came in late, feel free to check that out. It'll be up almost immediately after. And Cobra did an awesome job with the Tau one, which I highly recommend you check out as well. Uh, they did announce at Adepticon that there are three more codexes coming, and we already knew that Dark Eldar is on its way. Um, sitting 13 feet away from me is the Forge Bane box, which I'll be having... Uh, two armagers assembled, and I'm going to give away the other stuff to my friends because I don't play Necrons, and I don't need any more Adeptus Mechanicus. And then I'll be having a third armager painted up as well because I think three armagers in a Lord of War detachment complements Adeptus Mechanicus, Guard, Custodes really well, uh, and I'll be testing that theory. And when the Dark um, Eldar stuff, which is like actually probably I'm getting the Codex this week if I had to imagine... Whatever that embargo date is, I will do another stream immediately after. I want to reiterate again, I think the setup is awesome. I want to thank my wife, Anna, for letting me use her space, but also say um, we'll try to work out. Like, we have good internet here, so I don't know why we're dropping so many frames and stuff like that. We'll try to figure that out, um, and that'll be smooth next time. So that's the plan for now. That's that's Warhammer, and people have been asking. Uh, one thing people are saying is they were like, could you do previous codexes as well? I'm open to that. That is a lot of work, and I don't own those codexes. I, in the past, owned every codex, but um, we're trying to buy a house, and we're trying to—I'm trying to be a, a responsible adult human man, which means I can't buy every book it, that comes out. So, if you are really interested in me doing more codex reviews, um, check out my stream, donate the cost of a codex, and say, "Hey, I'd like you to do so and so codex" or something like that. I'm okay with that. You're helping me out. That's great. And of course, I'm churning out content, so it's not like it's completely selfless of me. Um, but I'm just not going to spend my own money buying up all the codexes. But if you want to endeavor to, to help me out in that in that cause, that's great. Hopefully, you guys find that fair enough as an exchange. Otherwise, the last thing I want to advertise is just my Discord. Um, 
we have a lot of awesome conversations there but if you're here listening to this then on some level you're interested in warhammer and we have a ton of discussions there about that i'm gonna be writing up some articles i just took um top eight at adepticon with my custodians i'm very excited about it um and i've been playing a lot of warhammer and i've got a lot of exciting news coming up in that regard so stay tuned check out frontlinegaming.org as well my lovely sponsor and where all my other warhammer content goes um that's it thank you guys so much really appreciate it and we'll get that video up to you guys as soon as possible you guys take it easy